Welcome, Legends. How are we doing today? It is match day eight, and that means that we begin with one of our final days before we decide who is going to land. And of course, who's even going to be in our regional finals to seal the deal officially. Everything counts. Every kill matters. Every rotation could be what books your ticket. So without further ado, let's get started. My name is Randy. I'll be your host. And I'm joined by not three, if you saw Mia, but two of my friends who you saw earlier and even better casters. Of course, we've got Vicky Kitty here. Vicky, match day eight, North America, big names, but even bigger stakes. Last day, too, for Group A to really perform. A lot of teams on the cusp, Rain Day, and I cannot wait to see the action play out before the regional finals. Speaking of regional finals, that's the goal. If you wanted to know what was important about today, everyone is focused on that. That's the next step, Dia. And as we're so happy to welcome you back on broadcast, I want to get your thoughts on what could be a very important, decisive day for some of our teams. It, it very much is, and as you say, with things coming to a close, with your last chances being on the line to avoid relegation from the regular split, I'm also really keenly focused on how North America continues to explore Season 20. We had a lot of the same being picked by many teams in our last two match days. Will match day eight bring something different? That's what I'm here to find out. I'm going to save a lot of that conversation for when we all get a chance to cast and work through these games because there's just so much to talk about and dive in in season 20. If you don't know, where have you been? All the new perks, 100 perks added to Apex Legends in season 20. It's been incredible in-game, and I'm sure we'll see you there. And of course, it's been great for our pro league as well. During this time, though, not only have we had a new season, we've had some changes. So getting into that, we want to update with you on what has occurred that maybe you might have missed. We've seen some roster adjustments and we have seen some name adjustments. Cream are now Empire. I like the way it's spelled. I like the logo. Somebody somebody makes logos in esports so fast. I don't know who they are, but it's like a new one every 30 seconds. Empire, formerly known as Cream, will be what they are represented as now as well. As when we look at some teams that didn't change their name, but changed their roster, we can see how iShiny joins GKS as a coach and Skirt drop Alberlelli. We mentioned that he retired. He wrote a whole thing on X about it. And Depressly joins in his place. So this will be the new look of how Skirt can hopefully keep going this season and make things happen. But of course, what we are We've kind of mentioned before is that this is a lot of a lot of changes happened in season 20 maybe a little bit more than we're used to some teams have adapted really well some teams are picking up pace and they need to because as it stands here's the overview of what we're looking at for the placements in north america dark zero as you can see on the very left hand side are the only team that have officially qualified for playoffs one of the cool thing about it though is that complexity after winning on match day seven if they do it again probably probably will join them as well but lg moist rounding out that top 10 with legacy finishing that furia dropping gaming disguise they're, they're kind of in the middle and they could make a few moves today to get that spot secured or at least as you can see in that box down below the regional finals guaranteed some teams though they're just fighting for a spot in pro league and some hopefully trying to avoid relegation those would be our teams on that back right side of it the thing is we will fill this out throughout the tournament of today and, and probably before you see it in our regional finals to give you up-to-date references on who's done what who's secured that way you all are aware of it but i also want to talk about those three teams up at top maybe not all of them but some of them uh vicky when we look into land these three teams they they are on everyone's mind absolutely i mean we know that these teams have room to mess around now basically to try out other options for the day and two of these teams are in group a today is that final day to put those points on board and if you want to test out anything from season 20 i mean you got the room to do it here tsm currently sitting in fifth overall luminosity gaming sweet being that topic bringing the squad together are currently sitting in third place while legacy former all mexican team that was dropped by luminosity now still putting themselves on top who are currently sitting in 10th place overall which may not have as much room to breathe as TSM and Luminosity considering the fact that the top 11 teams and the winner of the regional final advances split win playoffs but it still allows Legacy to see what they have to do differently since they had to ramp up at the start of the split. 
Listen, Omit almost did it in EMEA. They might have won without winning yeah. an actual game. It didn't work. TSM, they're in fifth place, but they have yet to win a match day. Will this be the one? You know that Sweet is going to be trying to stop that from happening for sure. Dia, other teams not worried about playoffs just yet. They're trying to give themselves a chance and have to rely on winning that regional final. Yeah, a lot of big surprises here. I think to a lot of people who would have expected these squads to be among the top. X said, I think the biggest... Uh, the biggest focus for people who would have thought that they'd be placing higher at this point in the season. Right now, they're sitting around 17th, which is still plenty of time to make it into regional finals comfortably, but they have not had the easiest moment. Even in the Group A versus C matchup that we had last time, they did only place seventh. GKS in the last time these two groups played, however, ended up placing second, a sharp contrast to where they currently sit in the overall standings at ninth. After qualifying through the preseason quals, GKS are certainly a team to keep your eyes on. Although, I'll be honest, Ray and Vicky, I'm getting drawn towards Native most recently. They had a big <laughs> uptick in their performance just last week, and I'm a fan of Rainbow. He's got nice hair, and he, Clean, and Luxford are certainly looking good together. Listen, I was going to say you're getting drawn to it because of the hair. There's no way. I mean, yeah. they got a great story as well, but I knew that, Dia, that was what was the big deal. And you know what? They've been playing great. Rambo joined us last week. We had a chance to catch up with him. He had said that they've got some things to figure out, and he wants to work on it. But it's not a solo squad. It's not a solo endeavor. His whole team has to put in that effort and figure it out. That's why we had a chance to talk with Luxford a little bit earlier and see his thoughts on this squad's performance and what they hope to do in the future. Hi, my name's Luxford. I'm a professional player for Native Gaming. My teammates are Rambo and Klain, and our coach is Brayden. Uh, coming from Meat Lovers, it was a bit of an adjustment because Meat Lovers plays uh, more edge play style than as Native, they play very hard zone, early rotate play style. My role on the team is very simple and very easy to me. All I have to do is feed Klain ideas and make sure that when we need to speed up, we speed up, and when we need to slow down, we slow down. Yeah, going into the match, me and the team talked about the teams that could pass us and the teams around us for us to win the day. Uh, Dark Zero and SSG were on those teams on our, like, I guess, kill board. And those were the teams we were worried about going in if you go into game six. Uh, at the end of the game in the end zone, there was a solo across from us. And we identified that it was a solo way too late. But if we identified it a little earlier and killed that solo, we would have ended up winning the, the game day, which is a little bittersweet, but it happens to the best of us. Uh, me and the team are very confident going into regional finals, especially at coming off of the great game day that we had. We've just been in the lab, VOD reviewing as a team, making sure we're all on the same page. We have great support from the OR, good backing. So me and the team are very confident going into regional finals. Absolutely locked in. You could tell Luxford is ready to go. And I like the conversation around, I just tell Claim whether we need to speed up or slow down. His job is simple. It feels like sometimes that means you could focus on other things like performing at your best. They've averaged in A versus C about seven and a half points whenever they have played in this lobby matchup. But last time, last match day, they got 18, a third place time with Dark Zero. We'll see if they can bump it up and repeat that here in A versus C. I want to talk about those, the teams that need to survive. And by that, the surviving hasn't even begun yet because they aren't in the place to have a chance. We know Native is going to probably be able to see if they can win that regional final, see if there's a way to do it. Some teams, though, they're trying to literally just get in the regional final. And that is kind of where I want to lead my focus here for right now. These teams playing today, Meat Lover, Sentinels, and FaZe Tech. Zenile, Zara, three players who we've seen in our league for so long. Tech notoriously saying, everyone knows when I pick a good player up, he's going to get taken soon because I just have an eye for it. He's certainly proven that, but the rotation, like playing uh, Edge a little bit more this season, has not worked to put them in a position to be in the regional final yet. Currently sitting outside at 
23rd place. Sentinels, another thing. Zanile, Arcan, Arcan, and Luda. This is a team that has obviously come together and tried to figure out what's the best way for us to play, to be aggressive, to try to play zone. Have we done what we needed to? I think this is a team with a lot to prove, uh, whether it's in the community or whether it's just in game. And I think this is something for today. We'll see a big story, shine a big spotlight on to pay attention to. And another team, I think this is more just surprising, phase Zara tricky panda snipe down you know three incredible pros people who have been in apex legends and succeeded at the highest of high levels really close to not being even in that regional final to have a chance to get to land so huge opportunities huge moments for them and as we zoom out and see everybody's moment there's other teams that I haven't even mentioned. Disguised, Furia, all of these teams alongside Oxygen Esports who have won uh, match day three, I believe, are going to compete today. It is a star-studded lobby. And of course, you cannot forget the TSMs, the X sets. My goodness, it's going to be a fun one today. We've set the story up, but now it's time to see what happens and kick off the first act. So guys, I'm done, but I'm going to leave it over to you. I'll catch up in just a bit. Vicky, Dia, take us away to game one. Thank you so much, Rain Day. Dia, we're back at it again, and we get to see NA play out for some of these teams their last match day before the regional final. It is pretty tight knit up there in the overall standings and a pretty impressive lobby, too, because you're also thinking about faring up against the likes, as we mentioned before, TSM, LG, Moist, Dark Zero. It's going to be crazy to see how this plays out today. It, uh, and it fe it feels like at the start of the season, we were all talking about, oh, who is the group of death? Now that we're moving towards the end of it, and we're thinking about just what teams can hang on to survival or not, as the stakes continue to climb, I'm sure you could tell, Vicky, I'm very excited, especially since there's so much, ex so much experimentation going on right now. So many different teams have varied reads on what we can do. We saw it so much in EMEA, but even here in North America, we talked about Native earlier. They're running Seer. We've got Disguised, who are alternating between running Catalyst and Caustic, and it, there's just so much yet to figure out. Yeah, and while we get set up here too, Dia, our first three games are going to be on World Edge, and that comes into consideration how some of these compositions might come into play for some of these teams. Again, first three games on World's Edge before we make that transition into Storm Point for our final three games. So the topic here is for a lot of these teams, can they stay consistent? We see teams have their pop-off moments where they've been experimenting after season 20 changes, but they fail to get the dub until the very end of the day, which always leaves us at the edge of our seat, Dia. It's, it's really difficult, especially when the zones impact your ability to place high, get kills, whatever it may be so often. These are just a few of the zones that we've seen throughout our season. And as we start piling in even more of them, You'll note that we've had a lot of opportunity for many different teams to succeed. Notably absent, however, are things like Trials and Skyhook zones that normally we would see Exet be able to thrive in. Those haven't been around nearly as much and may be part of why we're not seeing this team succeed as much during the course of the split. That's a really good point, especially considering the Exit's one of those teams that come out from really great loot, usually between Trials and Skyhook, and make that rotation into where a lot of these circles seem here to be pulling over to that south side. Yes, we've seen a lot of these northeast circles, but it's usually that south side that we see a lot of these teams rotating from the north side to really struggle through those chokes, specifically chokes looking between staging into Harvester, where a lot of these teams like Exit happen to fall whenever they are in a pinch. Now, when we're thinking about how to start the game, where you're going, the biggest focus is going to be on 50-50s, wherever they may be occurring. Take a look up north at where Meat Lovers and Nine Lies will be dropping together at Climatizer. Neither of these teams particularly safe in the overall standings, neither of which had a good day the last time these two groups faced off. Nine Lies finishing in 17th and Meat Lovers in 20th. But while Meat Lovers has changed their roster, Nine Lies has not. Will that extra synergy actually be an edge for them in the climatizer contest or is it too little too late really too considering how you have to work up that synergy once again especially incorporating the season 20 changes and the rotation points that climatizer provides i mean we've seen so many different northern circles that once you land in climatizer you come on top from that 50 50 you not only do you have the climatizer loot but you have the option depending where the circle pulls whether you want to go for a quick rotate with the jump tower being right there over to overlook where you usually have the beacon if you're lacking that beacon in climatizer for whatever reason, or if the circle does end up pulling more so towards 
that west side, you could take that back, rotate away from survey more towards that monument area. And while we're thinking about places like Climatizer, it's worth noting that in Season 20, Edge POIs that do take up a lot of space, Climatizer, Thermal, are really good examples, have been buffed in an odd sort of way just because of the way that Evo Harvesters spawn. If you are landing around the side of the map, you're going to have more opportunity to pick up a greater amount of Evo Harvesters likely bins whether they be support or assault crates as well and that should be getting you to blues or even purples in a way that zones simply can't match anymore and that separates the rotating teams with pathing at the same time because your pathing mm -hmm. is going to rely on that evil harvester where you want to make sure that if you are playing much more of a passive composition you want to play for end circle you want to set your pathing around those evil harvesters those assault bins the support bins that you were just mentioning right now as well as the survey and ring consoles to look at for a lot of these teams things have changed in season 20 we got a sneak peek last weekend at the teams that were experimenting and now we get to see it play out again and when time is of the essence, Dia, let's not waste any more time. Game number one is underway here on World's Edge for North America. And World's Edge, just because of how long it's been in competitive, is one of the places where we actually see more experimentation than we do on Stormpoint. People often prioritize pretty high mobility, big cover legends like Bangalore Horizon when we move over onto Stormpoint. But when we're on World's Edge, even this morning, Vicky, we saw things like Caustic Maggie Wraith, a composition that two seasons ago, even last season, you wouldn't have dreamt of, not even in the wildest challenger circuit lobby but here at the pro league level we're getting to see world's edge and the comfortability that it brings give us so much experimental gameplay at the professional level that actually is giving us a totally new look at apex legends as a title i'll draw your eyes again to some really interesting picks native on the left side of your screen picking up seer a legend that literally no other team in north america is even thinking about right now it's crazy to see the different legend compositions also play out into the strength of individual players that then lead to the cohesiveness of the team. Like we saw in Amiya, so much lifeline, yet you look at North America, lifeline isn't even part of that topic. Instead, you have that soul crypto, even maybe Seer coming into play, and it looks like our legends are already dropping out of the ship. I can't wait to see how some of these legend comps also play a part into that 50-50 that we're going to be seeing at Climatizer. Yeah, the early drop does mean the Climatizer kicks off early, and Nine Lies are going to take the far flight path. This will give them priority on a northern rotation they choose to take it and actually escape, putting relatively few teams in the way of Nine Lies. And I have to wonder whether Meat Lovers are going to push onto the far side or wait for Nine Lies to come to them. A Horizon pickup early in the game does give a small edge to Meat Lovers. Allows them to get up to the high ground just as quickly, too. Line lies already trying to get information. Because they're going to be able to rotate right back to the building here. But it's about where that survey beacon is on the other side of Climatizer that gives the edge over to the other team. Because now they also are going to have a little bit more extra credit towards those evil shields. B based on composition alone, nine lies should leave. They don't, like you said, they don't have the beacons, and they also don't have a horizon. They've chosen to run a composition that, just like everyone else's, or as the standard composition of right now, Bangalore Caustic Bloodhound, should be letting them succeed later on into the game. An early fight against a horizon is just too much of a gamble to put your whole game on early on. So I like that Nine Lies are moving away. Meat Lovers don't want to force the issue either, and both teams get to live. Meat Lovers, however, get to thrive. Evo Harvester spawn means that they insta-hit blues and can move on from here. And they're going to just feel successful in leaving out of this POI with picking their first set of perks and the blue Evo shield. They are just winning with that RNG rotate as Nine Lies. They do leave Climatizer, but who lands in survey is GKS rotating from Epi and survey. So that may be a fight going down soon. As you can see the overhead here, there is that jump tower as well, just in case they need to get out of the fray and they don't get shot out of that zip line like sitting ducks. But a team that does quickly rotate out of Overlook that leaves Meat Lovers open for this rotate out of that other side of Climatizer is Sentinels. This is a team that likes to play already within where that next circle is going to be pulling, so they waste no time usually when it comes to those rotates. 
<laughs> we can see it on his screen right now. We take the big, <laughs> the big shot, and we're not even anywhere close to Overlook. We're in the middle of Epicenter, and Sentinels are ballooning again to get further into the zone. In fact, their rotate is so quick and so fast that it puts them right on top of Native, who land much closer to this choke point than anyone else. Sentinels will have the opportunity to escape, to... Uh, establish their presence around one of these chokes before moving forward again, but I don't think they'll be waiting too long because they have got a ring to get to. They have places to be in Oxygen. The floor is where they're sitting at right now, looking at Vayne. Reed splits his attention right behind him, sends out the Caustic Barrel. I want to bring attention over to that pick rates that we just saw on top of our screens, by the way. Oof, you already know I'm not very happy, Dio, but it's just because of the stinky man who's made his way after season 20 into these legend comps. The main state comp, and it's the caustic. 19 caustics out of the 20 teams in this lobby. But they may have some room to breathe for right now on the outskirts of Harvester because Furia are wrapping right behind Dropped In Gaming. Bloodhound ult is not one that you'd normally see used offensively. This is very much a defensive ult, one that's meant to buy you space between your rotation and Furia, who, to their credit, back off. Now that you've gotten Bloodhound and Bang ult, I think it's pretty safe to say that you're not going to get a good engagement because the team in front of you is so focused on running away. Furia instead will focus on their own rotate and should be able to pick another fight. Plenty of teams like to come through Harvester and there's the opportunity for them to even clash with TSM on the way in. Talk about getting caught in that rotation since TSM leaving out of Lava Siphon, but they do leave with an Evil Harvester on their end as well as two beacon scans that they could benefit from. But while they do make their way over to Harvester with a, another survey beacon right there and the Replicator, you can see Fury already quickly rotating out, but bringing the focus to the teams that are playing by the edge right now. Moist has no issue taking these fights to a lot of these teams. That is definitely another team that we didn't highlight at the very top of the show that has no problem just having fun in these type of lobbies. They are feeling incredibly confident even talking about tweets from waltzy saying you know what you guys have two apac teams leading na right now how are you guys feeling and they've definitely been able to perform up to their words too so they're now going to be able to hang out by this choke you see waltzy getting that scan over by a team that's still inside of that vault tunnel and they're also going to be able to get whatever they need on top of no name if there is a beacon there yeah and once moist hit the survey yeah, beacon They'll have the data that meat lovers are rotating behind them through guys or there's opportunity to cut off, say, meat lovers on that choke if they would like to. But I am really curious with this prediction that Moist can now make based on where other teams are in the zone, where will they think that us, the strongest position is? Do they want to play through the edge and look for kills or are they going to try and get into countdown like everyone else? To see with their slow rotate. Opposite side though with TSM with their quick rotate. Ah, it's like we've taken a time capsule back in time to look at TSM with Verhols being on this Valkyrie. And with some of these pings and with that Skyward dive, they are going to be making these quick rotates. But what I don't want to see, Dia, the end game Skyward dive, the TSM Valk ult Hail Mary that cost them last weekend a few games ubing isn't the same with some changes too there's startup to taking out your weapon you can't preemptively wind up an ability dropping out of ubing and that comes into play with the way that you may want to try to delay these valkyrie ults into final circle which is why we're seeing them quickly rotate now back around to thermal station where legacy has not moved from their poi as we also see where the circle's pulling over to the north side it's interesting how long Legacy have chosen to take right now. It's a slow move up from Tree into Thermal. Disguised got to pass up through Thermal into Mirage, but TSM missed them both. Now that they're stuck in between these two squads, I think that endgame Valkult that you talk about is becoming all the more likely, Vicky, because TSM have given up a lot of time to get to the Evo Harvester, and that means that they're not going to have great position on a smooth walk-in towards rings four and five. That's a really good point. Ooh, over sleepers. Try to take a nice little cheeky angle with the Sentinel. Backing away. He did use that Nox nade, though, from inside. 
didn't get the credit that they were expecting, at least from that team that they were trying to cast out of that building. It looked like they may have wanted to get that survey beacon information, considering the fact that Charmander's on that Bloodhound. But they're getting pinged by another team in the distance, and look who's right around the corner. It is Moist. MT taking a good chunk of damage, but the team in front of them is stuck in between two teams before they rotate out. Terrible spot for Oversleepers to be. It leaves you with really only one place left to play. Oversleepers have to move in and now take the tunnel that lies between Landslide and Skyhook. It's not in the next zone, but it provides you the most cover from two teams next door. So it'll be where they play for now. Plenty of other teams on the opposite side of the ring also struggling to get into zone disguised. One of those squads who again have switched things up, this time running Bloodhound, I think notably, or rather taking note of what happened last week and how popular the Bloodhound is, you simply can't pass up scans like Bloodhound gives. Especially when you're the entry fragger, as Timmy has shown time and time again what an insane player he is, but I also want to bring attention to the only Wraith in the lobby being designed. We've seen them stick to this when they were experimenting with Fuse uh, last week, I believe, and now with some changing up, they've still stuck with the Wraith. So we know that with the perks, you could always have Wraith's portal uptime pretty consistently when it comes to some of these tricky rotates, but how are they going to approach this next circle considering the fact that they're in Lava Fisher, they're north of where Fury is right now, they're looking at Skirt, and TSM is right around the corner corner after their rotate out of thermal through mirage into the south side of lava fisher uh, uh did that huh i i think that i think that went off i think i think that kidnap worked <laughs> i'm looking at the top right of my screen and, and skirt are gone disguised pulled off that kidnap just in the nick of time earning themselves not only another kp but a little while closer two placement points that'll start to stack in in the next three squads and we are going to get three squads falling perhaps not on this ring close that might claim the lives of one or two but towards the next ring close that pulls everyone further into countdown that's when teams like meat lovers and moist who are currently engaging are going to have to fight harder than they would otherwise be forced to say in this ring close I heard of them, at least the teams that have already been in Countdown, like LG that always calls out these end circles. Sweet, always on point. But this also means with a Countdown circle, there's going to be a lot more teams in the end game because there's a lot of real estate to share for those teams that could be on the high ground or on the low ground of Countdown, depending on the positioning on where this circle is going to be pulling towards. Now, as we saw a voice right in front of Meat Lovers and Meat Lovers looking to maybe get involved or disengage or rotate to the back end, let's jump into a listen to see how they want to take this rotate. This is good, this is good, this is good. I'm walking up, I'm walking up. 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 I'm walking Hold up, just we got Kenneth. 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 We got all the Havoc beams at the very end. Tech being the last one alive. Not before they at least were able to get that knock up to guild, but that knock alone has allowed Tech to buy some time to try to rotate out of this circle. Moist now restabilizing, but they still were able to clean two out of Meat Lovers in that engagement. And really unfortunate for Meat Lovers who were already fighting at a disadvantage on the low ground. But Sentinels are no strangers to doing much the same as they move in through Caustic Gas underneath Countdown. This could be the end of Sentinels. That one nade knocks Luna and Sinile is barely able to stay alive through the ensuing gas. I think they'll be able to get this res, but so many teams on low ground really suffering. As Moist start to move in, they may actually encounter Sentinels relatively soon as lots of attention will be coming towards Countdown from the eastern side of World's Edge.
And that's with Oblivion on top of them, harassing them from the high ground with these nades here too. While Set Nose do manage to at least reset for now, he mentioned Moist and they're moving in. MT's literally one, but he'll have some time and space. Oh, the Rolling Thunder actually got him when he was just a second away from popping that bat. That's gonna be the green light for the team right across this rock to try to fully engage. Guild handling it himself. He throws out that Nox gas and now he's gonna back away in time to reset here. DNO, get eliminated in your feed with 16 squads left. We'll have Blood Ult up soon. Unfortunately, scan from the back just as Walt sees Ult goes off. Beast to the Hunt may not be enough to save Moist. Waltzy just gallivanting off into the sunset, avoiding GKS while they can. Naughty does go down. GKS still on the hunt, still have a squad in front of them. Meat lovers have fallen as well. Placement point territory is here. Will GKS get the res? Can they actually survive with oxygen gatekeeping them? Oxygen coming out of Landslide, finding the perfect opportunity. Beats of the Hunt activated and the Gold Helmet to add on top of that. GKS get eliminated and Oxygen now have cleared this side of the circle before dropped in gaming. May make that long rotate out of Lava Fisher side right behind Oxygen through Landslide. Take a look at Oxygen's positioning as well. Focus your eyes on the upper left hand side of the screen. They've got an amazing spot in zone. No one else is playing out towards Landslide. Every other team put themselves in count down but it is up to oxygen to hold this space and drop in gaming are making it so difficult with the initial drop and then thirst onto vein drop in gaming are taking no prisoners they are only taking all of the open space that oxygen worked for Oh, the fact that Oxygen lost one of their members to Dropped and Dropped was the only team on this side of the circle that Oxygen had to worry about. And now they've given this space over to Dropped in, who had the advantage off the rip from that fight, thanks to that Thermite positioning too. Now they have to play for their lives as a duo here as Oversleepers is to their north. And we take a look at TSM hanging out in front of these bunker doors right alongside the Skies and Evolution, who are on the other side of the bunker. No time for the Valkyl to go off. TSM have to play for dominance in Countdown, and a good smoke in front of them does cover. Just enough for Rep to drop back in with the Eva. Almost finding a knock onto Caustic, but ultimately being unable to clinch it. Wraith Portal would provide some temporary safety, but it's a big unknown. Caustic Gas not going to save them as Rats just around the corner gets taken out, and it was disguised to drop down. It's Sentinels to come in to clean up. Great timing here. Reps was so close at getting around the corner, but even if he did, there was really nowhere else for him to go with this circle closing in too. Look at all the chaos. Sharing countdown. Nine lives. Native gaining Furia, who have wrapped around the other side of countdown, taking circle damage. And this circle will make your eyes water. Native gaming have the hike here. Rambo has to be careful. Taking a lot of damage here while they take some shots at the teams right below them. And this is where the nades come into clutch. He forces them out from the corner. He manages to pop the shield back from right under underneath them and hearing let's ready talk earlier in an interview dia they know exactly what they have to do differently here but can they clutch it out here on the high ground on the edge of the circle and notice that clean isn't using zero yet we've got a team on height just chilling waiting for their time to strike native are watching all of this play out even as nine lives lose member after member the eva really putting in work for exit who are kill hungry nine lives do go down exit weak on the low ground but they should be all right with, an, with the ability to stabilize given to them by things like Caustic and Koifel's scan already up. Oxygen taking care of Moist 2 in the feed while they're playing off that low ground while all the fighting is happening on the other side of this countdown barrier. See his Watson still alive while natives still hold on to the high ground. Sentinel's still playing on the outskirts, but they're still in the line of sight of other teams behind them as Aiden gets called out as the rat from Oxygen. He goes out in eighth place. Blinkster gets a knock with the Sentinel. Sentinels have nine kills so far. Sentinels are rolling this lobby and it is a totally unprecedented move in split one of year four. Sentinels who have been such a passive team have killed so many squads that they're already almost certainly a top five for the first match. Oblivion did take some space away from them, have reduced them to just a duo, but if Sentinels can survive even two more spots in this game, they will have had one of the biggest games for them of the season. 
Got to put some respect on RKN's name out here. Putting himself on the board with changing up this composition, welcoming C20. X set, drop from the high ground. There's another team of mine that I wanted to watch. Sends out the Nox nade. Fun. I'm not too sure if that nade actually just bounced off his teammate's back, but Koifo is going crazy with this ball. He needs energy ammo. He needs to rotate into that next circle. He can't get the res. And Oblivion now moving while getting shot from behind, turning their entire backs to Native, who scoop up the remaining kills. We are just giving away kill after kill after kill. Native have survived up until the top three, but they will not make it any further. Having made a trade with Oversleepers, you know who that's given it to. It's the team that took the open ground early in the game. It's the team that duped Oxygen out of Landslide. It's drop-in gaming that come in and clean up at Countdown. What a dub for dropping gaming. A dub that they needed here too. A definite team that wants to keep themselves afloat above these rapid waters. And with 6kp at that too in a very chaotic end circle, Dia. Very much so. That, that entire end circle was just in the west. It was only at countdown that anything was actually happening. The rest of the map, oversleepers sat in the north at an RV and drop in gaming, played a few rocks near the sniper tower, but they didn't have to do anything. They just watched the rest of the game happen around them and credit to them. Both teams for coming in, picking up a kill and a win respectively. It will mean that for those two teams, they'll be a little lower on the kill side of things than teams like Xset might be. So despite the fact that dropping gaming got a win, they might not actually have the most points in match one. Yeah, they do rotate from Geyser, but it was holding that position that you talked about where Oxygen were in the best spot, dropped in, came in, and they literally dropped in, took one of their teammates, and were able to hold that site instead while keeping themselves out from being in a very bad situation from the teams that had to exit out of Countdown. You don't want to be on that side where Sentinels was at, where you are inevitably going to get pinched on that low ground. So dropped in in the best spot to take that game for that circle pool. And meanwhile, looking at teams that came out of Countdown, I can't help but applaud Xset, who, as we said, very much needed points coming into today, played really aggressively to make that happen, and Disguised, who on the Wraith had a lot of attention on them and actually really made it work, taking out multiple squads. Sentinels cannot escape our attention either. A lot of teams that may not have been at the top of anyone's minds coming into today had really big breakout games to start us off on World's Edge. And this is where you ramp up that momentum too, with dropped in being in 12th place in the overall standings here in NA. They want to make sure that they're safe enough to make it into land where they don't have to sweat too hard looking at the regional finals and how the other teams do out here. They want to make sure that they have a lot more room to breathe. And when you take that first game, even though it wasn't a lot of KP, it's a great way to kickstart your day on World's Edge with there being two more games on World's Edge specifically. And we had even raised questions about meat lovers when we started talking about today and around the roster changes at Climatizer. Drop-in gaming have also had several roster changes, and this isn't one that drew nearly as much attention because, honestly, they are not a team that is nearly as active on socials as meat lovers. But as soon as this, as this day started, as soon as the roster changes happened, what it's normally correlated with is a drop in standings, not an immediate game one win on some of your last match days of the split. So drop in could be making a big rev up, a big momentum pull for the regional finals. But a lot of that is going to be determined based on whether they are able to carry this over into game two. Because as you said, Vicky, having two more games on World's Edge emphasizes one of the most important things in Apex Legends, and that's your ability to replicate what you just did. And we're going to be able to see how they did after that first game at the other side of this break, guys. Don't go anywhere. We got match one results as well as match number two underway.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to you. You and Vicky cast that last one. We're going to get into game two, though. World's Edge is always fun. We had a countdown zone that pulled way farther out than we thought. A lot of teams made the bet. It worked out, though, for Drop In Gaming. And we have yet to confirm those results. We will in just a second. But uh, look at that. I mean, a great start. Sometimes getting the best spot in that way, winning that one crucial fight, can do it all for you. And you had mentioned this a very low kill game it was decent better than i i might have expected they did win two crucial fights but you could see a lot of parity here in this one whether you won or not in our game number one yeah and in, in the grand scheme of things being able to win a game is going to be nice but this isn't one of those big explosive games that rockets you out ahead of the rest of the lobby instead drop in gaming are very closely shattered by oversleepers and native actually who had a surprisingly low kill game themselves are going to be joining them in the top three exit make it into top five and sentinels with their points yeah. should actually be placed in third after this match in the again overall points of the day this is big for sentinels sentinels need this <laughs> i mean unless someone in the bottom 11 through 20 has like uh, 12 kills then yeah i think they should be third no 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 one's jumping disguise <laughs> though 11 they have seven points off of six kills but you could see that's exactly what happens when you take the risk to say we're going to fight now and get kp or we're going to try and work for that end game sometimes it works out dropping gaming got 12 points off of that alone but sentinel said we don't have an easy path but we're going to fight through it and be on the war path so to speak and that is one of the things that they were not able to continue when they ran into just better position teams Look at this, Oriolis dropping gaming. It's a good start for him. Five kills, the uh, great way to begin your match day. Yeah, and the most important thing about dropping gaming, about Oriole's performance, isn't that the kills were numerous, but that they came at the right times and in the right places. Something that we saw a lot of teams miss out on when we were seeing fights around the edge and even in countdown. That fight you're fighting for places that aren't going to give you an active spot to get more kills or to win the game. Dropping gaming at the very least when they were fighting only took fights that directly furthered them towards first place yeah. which is pretty darn cool to see it work out it's efficiency that's that's the best way to, to describe it match two we'll see if we continue with that efficiency or if someone who is on the more aggressive path actually can take a win because that's where you see those 30 bombs that were dropped earlier in EMEA will North America have their own well there's a chance to find out what stands out to you though as we see the legend select screen come up before we drop into the game i'm definitely keeping tabs on the meat lovers nine lives compositions because it means a lot for the ensuing fight that we may or may not get a climatizer as meat lovers continue to pick horizon and we continue to see nine lives just go with this bangalore bloodhound caustic it's so clear to me that the nine lives don't actually want to fight a climatizer which is actually putting meat lovers in a really difficult position because it means that you're getting half loot and the other team is happy with that. The other team is going to move on and forget. But meat lovers are forced into a really awkward rotation. They can't move through the north. They can't actually play the game the way they want to. And part of why I always bring up when I can the differences between someone performing on match day A versus B or A versus C is because of these inter interesting stories. You can look at, wow, this team's inconsistent, or wow, this team popped off then. What happened the next day? Well, a lot of times it's where they're landing, who they have to rotate to, the things that happen when you are with another group of players and squads who just clash with what you're also trying to do. Sometimes it limits people who can be successful. So you see these standout winners in that, or sometimes it means everybody is equal because no one's getting the guaranteed footing across all six days. They're battling for each and every game. It's a battle regardless, Dia, in, in Apex, but sometimes th those things are just really good to know, be prepared for. And obviously, as we get closer to land where you're switching groups every day, uh, you're going to have to be good at it. Yeah, and, and it's a, very much a reality of the, just the things you have to adapt to in your day-to-day -day as a pro player. Both teams are doing this really well, but the, it is also 
cutting short their performances in different ways. Nine Lies in this case did get priority on an Evo Harvester, so should be able to rotate out into GKS's territory without too much of a problem. North Rotation actually not looking bad for a zone like this. You've got a lot of potential to loop through Skyhook, go into Lava Fisher Countdown. All of these areas not particularly great to hold down, so Nine Lies should have a pretty good time. When you look at Meat Lovers and how they'll have to path through Sentinels, we already know Sentinels is going to be moving, but moving through Lava Siphon, through Harvester, that's a really punishing rotate. Exit on Skyhook as well, just coming from that area since you mentioned it. A lot of teams already making their move, but with the evil harvesters and being able to complete trials, get the damage, and level up your shields, you got to say, especially for a team in a southern zone, which will force some rotations, there's going to be some teams sitting on blues later into it. And not just blues, Dia, that means they won't have that third perk. So a team like Exit who might be able to do trials, get to purples a lot quite uh, a lot faster and still rotate because they're on the western side of the map at least they could be coming into that final zone with a big advantage and this is a day x set need to make it happen and if you're a team like oxygen who we actually just saw on screen who have been forced to rotate in not just with blues but with whites like native are now Ooh. you're running caustic and have whites you're ability to impact the map is cut in half because of the ultimate and the enhancement that so many teams now rely on not just to make caustic great to make caustic viable again we didn't see caustic before for a reason the ult is the big thing that's changed if you're not getting this you're playing with old caustic and nobody picked that and one of the reasons too i, I just love the power creep i'm sure it's been something that people have whether they're watching now and they just stopped playing a few games of their own in Apex or have been grinding ranked, you you know there are certain levels of, of that power. Some come later, and Gibraltar, one of those legends that he's been messed around with, Optic dropped, brought him in, never really could get to level three. Uh, but one of his major perks is at level three, whether you're going baby bubble or bubble bunker, and you're extending the tactical time. For Caustic, the major, major perk is level two. So there's just so many things that have brought this character back into viability. It's been the perfect storm, really, Dia. It really has, and what it is worth noting that though they haven't gotten a lot of screen time today, there is one squad that's running Gibby uh, in today's games on World's Edge so far. DNO have chosen to make this uh, selection. So, if we get to see Baby Bubble or Big Bubble picked up a little later on, we'll at least know who it's coming from. Meanwhile, EV Lucian should be able to get a nice scan. Without a bubble, a smoke will do just as well to get you not only extra information, but extra... Ooh, can I call it EV Lucian? Since they're, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I guess you could. Hey, man, you, cool. I know it is. And, you know, part of, the, part of the elements here in Apex is that, man, we get to see and hear and witness a lot of fun, a lot of fun things. All these players, they're gamers, they're pros, but... Uh, they like to they like to have their own set of style and uh, as they continue to do that we get to kind of enjoy the characters that these players are and speaking of a team sitting very easily not really having to do much work in thermal station so far just yet skies they kind of went viral for a comment that uh, design had with uh, uh, enemy and you know what I think from that though there's a lot of passion to easily see this team is you is using to fuel their motivation to keep going they were great at land but now they just need to get back there and maybe that was the kickstart uh they were hoping for and needed it certainly has looked like it as disguised have played quite well furia another squad that runs in a similar way has a lot of big personalities on the team and has made it work to great effect the opener on this fight is fantastic nice 32 followed by the caustic gas means that you've got enough damage if you would like to push can't help but wonder if fury will actually finish on this watson swings in with oh. caustic not the opening fragger that we're all used to but gets out just as easily making the guy look like a movement legend after all crazy stuff with a beat 20 finds the damage on madness really really found a good rhythm here with this squad it is fit nicely Yuris, Vudo just trying to survive right now they've got their own caustic as well it means Vudo won't take damage from his Watson so has to kind of go big here in a situation when you're fighting in such an enclosed space and getting pushed but they've held on for now and it has put us into a bit of a stalemate disguise still where we had seen them last Sentinels and Legacy fighting south just next to where Evolution and Furia are fighting. But Diaz, we get down. It's clearly going to be a southern zone. This, though, after.
after this one, the pull that really changed it for us in Countdown uh, was the one after this. And it seems like, no, no one's, it's not swinging too far. It's kind of central uh, to where they were expecting, a little above thermal. But man, does it look good for Oxygen. I know I brought to question their white shield rotation and rain day i will die on that hill it is a questionable decision but man has it gotten them a good spot oxygen with the early caustic setup could actually defend this high ground that is so often a pivotal position towards rings four and five uh, that it lies just above the train tracks. A team like Disguise has already got to be preparing based on what they know about the ring with the scans that they've received, that this is ultimately going to be going onto high ground. And with something like Wraith as your, we'll call it a movement legend here, you don't actually have a lot of options for getting up to high ground. The portal is necessary to move Disguise from place to place. Yeah, I, I like the frequency of the portal. I think Wraith feels good. I do like her uh, perks as well this season. I've been a fan of, of this character. I think she's close. I, it's good to see her in Pro League again. It, it was the Wraith show forever when she was one of, if not the must-pick legends. But now it's it's definitely changed. In high ground rotation ability, Horizon was queen of that. Valkyrie as well, coming back into it. Wraith, it's, it's a little bit more of a select pick. But design seems to be pretty content on throwing it. Moist, though, they've been in a great spot. They had that fight as they were rotating earlier last game, and now on purples, they've done everything they need to do. Still a little bit of distance to run, but they're in a pretty decent spot to uh, at least armored up. Yeah, this is as good as you're going to get in terms of the perks, the additional power, and especially Bloodhound Caustic do really benefit from every Evo. With Bangalore, you do get this passive benefit, and... It's enough to make sure that there's cover for them as they move in and a little bit of extra information. For right now, a team like Moist doesn't have to move. They don't have to think about how to get into the next zone, uh, largely because they don't exactly know where it's going. But once it's revealed that everybody's going to be moving closer into Thermal, Moist will have to make a decision. Dude, whether they fight Meat Lovers, whether they try and evac over through squads like Oxygen and TSM, or whether they just fall in the culling and look for kills. <laughs> <laughs> it also does, as we see Oversleepers moving in, they had a great game as well. 17 points and second place overall in our lobby. It kind of means that there's a higher risk to going and kind of making that bet where it seems to be a safe thing. And it has in most of the ALGS's history to play zone, to sit zone. You're going to get some points. Now, if it does have that far swing and you've invested in that, you've almost got no chance to fight these teams who have leveled up their Evos and put themselves in a position to actually be able to fight. But luckily, things still working out for Oxygen and, and, and even Gaming Gladiators, they're in a great spot. But being on whites and blues, it's even riskier now. So it's kind of like whatever you decide to do, whether you decide to fight or whether you decide to play zone, um, there's risk to both. It's very true. And it's, it's the risk in, in a way of not having a good position or not being able to fight LG even now. Running that risk themselves is only on blues. They do still have a great spot to fight for if they can make it work. Arcstar stick on the top. Doesn't actually hit anyone just yet, but gets a little bit of chip damage in, following up it up with a grenade. LG, if they can take control of the inside of this building, have essentially won the fight. Could have been Slayer pushing up, but Sweet was so ready after that grenade hit. He said, I have to go get some damage. Can't get the knock though. And that's why it is so hard to fight against a Caustic, no matter what level their shield is. But that will do it. Skirt will be moved to the side for now. And LG will continue their ways. It hasn't happened so far today, but that's a good sign for one of our top teams in North America. Some fantastic usage of the caustic gas just to make sure that whatever ground you gain in the push, you keep as the caustic barrels continue to zone for you. Disguised, look for some kills, and while they may not find them initially, this very favorable trade is just made all the harder to deal with for DNO on the low ground because they can't actually punish Wraith. And I think that's one of the things when you look at, you know, I'm at a great spot, but to punish you, I've got to give that up. Well, it's it's not really worth it. And that's what these pros are so good at, making enemies have to make these difficult decisions and give up something in order to get it. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's just not worth it. Except, though, I've really wanted to see how they would bounce uh, into today. I felt that this was going to be a big day for them. It is points-wise, and it is for a team that has been such an iconic part of North America over these last few years. Let's listen in to Exet and see how they handle this song. 
below us. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna in a second. Yep, yep. We think skills. Maybe. Gothic 50. Bang 20. Is this, right here? 74 blue. Yep. We should try and get these kills. Nothing's on our right on the I don't see okay. anyone Dorito. Dorito? Okay. Yeah, I don't see anybody. The bang's running south. We should go yeah. flat. We should go west. We should go west. 100 on the Gothic. We should go west. Yeah. Blue and east. They're running. Yep. Let's go, let's go. Gothic flush. 30. One shot. Peeking over. Yeah, Where? team here. What's, what's, we gotta what's, fight what's, this, we gotta fight this, we gotta yeah. fight this. Bomb bottle. Yep, batting. Constant goal, they wasted constant goal. Yep. Yeah. I'm walking forward. Careful, 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 careful. Yeah. in spot. Yep. I need a bat, I need a bat, I need a bat, I need a bat. Play slow, play slow. I need, yeah. Yep. I, I constant goal the door. We're good. Yep. We, need, we need to push forward. I'm one, I'm one after that. Yep. Constant 50. Behind us, minus, we're getting mirrored. We have to kill forward. Constant cracked. No. Blood one, blood in. I saw you, I couldn't do anything. Literally everywhere. Oh, it hasn't been that kind of day yet for Xset. More to come, but Oversleepers survive yet another one, and they'll be able to eat their way out. Eth on a sliver of HP as well. It was so, so close, but unfortunately, the sandwich comes for us all. And in this case, Gaiman Gladiators come for Moist, sitting right underneath this train tunnel. Gaiman Gladiators are able to stabilize, get the res off, and now pick up some much needed HP as more teams are sure to come in from the north. This zone continues to pull in the south, and squads like Oversleepers wow. are gonna have to move into this, whatever this is, <laughs> Furia fully just aping Sentinels. Unbelievable, these two teams put themselves in one team is going home type situation. We both are not making it out of here alive, but just as I say that, our RTN says, well, okay, let's change the rules of engagement. Maybe I'll stay alive, even though Luda and Zaniel have already bitten the dust. It's a tough spot for him to be in, though. As a caustic, no movement abilities on the low ground. RKN is just going to try to maybe get some placement and stay out of sight. But in sight is that alternator with those disruptor rounds. But he goes down right away over sleepers. Could this be it? Not looking for that angle into the fight. In fact, a res almost impossible here. Burtonade doesn't connect in a punishing way on over sleepers, and instead they'll go for the nade or the res, excuse me. Arcology does cover for a little while and another smoke gets expended. The amount of resources that oversleepers are putting in does make it more difficult for them to move forward, but this is not the final boss. Oblivion hardly matter right now. It's all about moving forward as fast as possible because you've still got to fight through Gaiman Gladiators. Teams are going to have to rotate. Only three teams, maybe Ooh. just a little bit of Gaiman are in zone right now. Everyone above or below and having to run Oblivion with a scan Arcology. Not even working with a shield battery he could use right now. Just trying to make it to safety and he does at least temporarily. And I think this is a good call. You don't have enough healing. Just try to do damage. Try to help your team in some way, make an impact. But I'm not sure he's gonna have the chance. Uh, he just, without ult, especially on Bloodhound, I mean, the legend is not going to help you in this scenario. No cover, no assistance. Oblivion have a sliver of this zone left to play. And they're entirely focused on gatekeeping other squads that might have come in. Drop in, don't get the shield swap, nothing connects there. Furia reset inside the tunnel, and the third party isn't going to be available for a team like Oblivion, who as a duo have no chance of taking out Furia. Yeah, GKS and Oblivion, like you said, above. They're going to have to make a tough decision on how do they rotate. LG also in a pretty decent spot. The skies have gone up north from where they started. They maybe walked 20 feet in this game so far, but it's been good for them. They found purple somehow, Dia, and that means with 15 points and in fourth already, they've got a chance to win. Not the easiest of zones, but, but this one is okay. Uh, the two teams we haven't seen in a minute, though, who are center zone, is Oxygen Esports, who rotated early, as you had mentioned, and TSM, who have found their way right next to Oxygen on a really great spot. It's so tough to hold on to this, but if TSM can do it, they've got good cover from above. They've clearly got the care package weapon right in front of them, and Oxygen should be able to help cover this. In this case, TSM do have to worry about Furia, who will come from the train line, and LG, rightfully so, have to focus back on Disguise, making sure that nobody rotates up through them. LG, funnily enough, gatekeeping Legacy with this maneuver as well. A little bit of rivalry there.
Yeah, and this is going to be something that continues, LG. <laughs> hey, saying that looks familiar over there. And they're like, no, no, no. New look. It's all good. Still great teams. And Funk with the Hemlock making it sing from far away. Oh, ho, ho. Can barely see anything, but he knows where they are at this point. And that's just going to be Legacy eliminated. Crawling out of that high ground. So difficult to do at this point, especially when Funk rarely misses his shots. But it's also going to mean on the other side, TSM and Furia are fighting each other. And I think... This also means that TSM, they're not going to be in a good spot. They go down, Dia, and all these teams look to be going down. LG arrive at the perfect time. Oxygen have just dropped two. And it should be just one solo member of Oxygen left. LG get one of the best spots in ring. Somehow on the low ground, DSG have survived. There we go. Oxygen are out. Furia are still up. And that's going to make our top three teams make it. Perhaps our top two because Funk has connected with enough shots that LG could probably drop down on the Thermite and take out Furia should they desire. And if you wonder why LG is sitting in third place right now overall, while this team is a team we're speaking of in such high regard, even though it's expected whatever Sweet is doing, Slayer and Funk, they have put together oh no. just a roster that matters and they have made it to this final three on high ground with really not a lot of contest. Look at the evac right behind LG. This is the biggest problem. The chance for Disguise to come up and take this game away from the Sweet has rightfully refocused, but does not have oh, the man. shields. Unfortunately, Disguise get gunned out of the sky. Designful never places the exit portal, and there's now no safe way up. No disguise for that one. He was plain in sight, and I think that's the problem. How do you get up from here? It's It's been the issue. They landed, but they didn't move fast enough during it. In one way, it's got them a top three, but in another way, it's a nearly impossible situation to win as such a good player. Six kills so far uh, for LG. They're looking to add maybe four more here if they take care of this solo or this I curious squad. LG are actually taking this wow. fight. They could go out in third, and right now it's looking like they will. And at the same time, Jimmy somehow crests the hill. It's crazy, and it should never have worked. But Disguised pick up a second place finish off of this. Magnus even dropping down just to finish the kill to collect one more KP is going to be unable to do it, giving another point to Disguised. It looks ludicrous, Rain Day, but this play from Disguised to survive until second place is so massive, and it is an unforced error from LG. What a moment. Furia takes it, and we were surprised there. They caught us looking left and went right, and they take this one after battling through the tunnels and coming out to not only kill TSM, but LG and Disguised. That is massive from Furia, and they take game two. Dia, that also means that a team that we have been kind of asking is on the bubble 11th currently right now, trying to, you know, find that way where they can cement being at land, get into some of those spots that are guaranteed for North America. 11 plus our play in winner from the regional finals. Uh, they need a performance to kind of get off of that cusp and to have it have it happen now. It, it's not a day too soon. No, and in fact, for many teams, it would have been a day too late, but picking up just a few points here and there for Disguised should push them into that land territory. And funnily enough, Rande, it's really just a return to what they are really good at. I mean, the first time we saw Disguised as Dojo was just at land right out of the LCQ, and they performed marvelously. I mean, and that's that's the thing about LG, excuse me, uh, you know, just the fact that when you get Disguised, who were going against LG in that tough spot, uh, when you get them to land, you feel like you've, you've already accomplished what you need because they'll perform. Oxygen, another team that when they are at land, really perform well. When they're in these big moments, they perform well. So it's about getting there, and I think that this is now especially even for Furia, uh, a, a very big day for those two teams particularly to get off of the cusp of almost making it and really push themselves into those seven, eight, six guaranteed spots. It'll mean that they've got to perform probably better than TSM, and TSM was in the mix there, but Furia, they, they took the fight and they ended up taking the game. As we take a look at the match results, uh, it worked out very, very well for them in the end, yeah.
It really did. And granted, TSM also much better game than in game one. So that'll feel real nice for them as they've got a bit of breathing room now that it wasn't just a one point finish. For Furia, though, clearly attracting a lot of attention. We've got a lot of good things to say about this squad. And well, we talked about them earlier, putting them right next to Disguised in this sort of big personality way. I do want to highlight that Madness is having one of the splits, one of the best splits of his career right now. Mm -hmm. He's currently top three in damage differential, putting out an average of per game 200 maybe 300 it's in the it's in the mid 200s damage more than his opponents that he's not taking back in return that's a full person with red evo shield that madness is able to take down every game that's a swing i mean and that's the type of thing that shifts the difference as if you needed better fighters than keon and his watson and you've got madness putting together like you said a split to remember and oh my gosh we thought a 30 bomb was big we oh wondered if we God. would see one in north america and we see one and they raise it up one with 31 points for furia taking the first place finish this is in an incredible way to get just your second game of the day. And let's not forget that Furia are not even close to done wow. with their season. They've still got a whole nother match day after this. And with performances like this in season 20, you can definitively say that they are adapting really well. And they're clearly getting a lot of work done in, in the standings, perhaps not even to re needing to rely on regional finals should this continue. Disguised pull up well, LG as well, although I cannot help but think of the comps that granted I cannot hear right now, but think of the comps that I'm sure are happening on LG right now for as good as third place is, there's going to be a lot to review about that end game. Uh, it's it's pretty impressive what they're doing and when you continue to see the lobby that they're playing against the LGs the TSMs the GKS GKS above Furia right now. So again huge uh, and, You know kind of spacing between them and the next best team, but disguise get a ton of KP back half of the lobby That is a different story. It doesn't mean that we haven't seen a ton of kills across game one and game two but that 31 bomb is going to distance you, especially for teams like Meat Lovers, like Sentinels, and like Xset, who we had all mentioned earlier going into today as needing big performances. It's so wild, Randy, that we I looked at Sentinels last game and went, who are they? And I look at them this game and I go, who are they right now? <laughs> Where are, are they? Two, like, it's, yeah, it's two totally different yeah. washes. And... Very surprising to see this late in the season and from a roster this experienced, but there's plenty, there's plenty more, I'm sure, where oh, yeah. game one came from. So we'll look out for them. Moist, Xset, DNO, Skirt, all these teams can place top five in any individual game. And just comparing our top two teams there, kills wise, 30 kills just about, nearly half the lobby taken down from these two teams. 21 assists on 19 kills pretty impressive and of course placement points 12 because they got first place but damage it also was in the way of furia like you to be expected and sometimes dia i think when you look at these two teams and you see the motivation a lot of teams feel safe right now i think this is the perfect level of, of competence meeting opportunity where dsg furia don't quite feel safe but they know they're pretty close but it's they've got to perform and i think now you're seeing that they have shot out in front of this lobby Will anyone be able to catch them as uh, hopefully we have our, oh yeah, I was going to say our results, but we've got our versus. Take a look at this. Speak to me about Keon and Enemy and the stats we got here, Dio. Yeah, and clearly this is impressive from both of them, but what, what's really standing out is the way that this relates to who they're playing. Keon is on Caustic and for Disguised Enemy, oh, what was Enemy playing? Enemy's also on Caustic, which is interesting because the fact that they're actually very close in stats uh, perhaps disguise falling a bit behind or rather enemy falling a bit behind in the kills speaks to the different role that caustic is taking on in both teams for disguise you you get caustic as much more of a finisher and for furia they're so reliant on all swinging things together that this difference this delta that you're getting in kills uh, is really made up by the play styles on two otherwise very comparable teams great points there Dia for sure also series results speaking of points furia they put themselves with one game in first place 31 points in game two adding to the four from game one disguised uh right behind them as well and drop in gaming after their good performance and win with 18 in game one they will sit in third 
over sleepers oxygen rounding out our top five bottom half though skirt dno gaming yet with a point meet lovers with only one a tsm a team people are obviously looking at uh heavily two games four points they're gonna want to pick that up for sure moist esports also having a relatively slow start compared to what we've known them to do yet yeah, I am going to include teams like Legacy in there as well. 16th yeah. place, three points. Very unexpected. I will focus everyone, however, on the squad in fifth place, Oxygen, for what well, we did talk about them a lot in game number two. It wasn't because they were actively slaying everyone, but simply because they protected the ring well. And they actually, if you'll recall, did that in game one as well, ultimately taken down by drop-in gaming. But the way that they're reading zones right now. The way that Oxygen are reliably pinpointing what power positions and rings are is interesting to track mm. as we look towards this last game on World's Edge. Because if they can do that consistently, they'll be moving up the leaderboards further than fifth. Well, firepower, it is not missing in North America. 31 points in game two from Furia and a win. What will happen in game three? Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Welcome back, everyone. What a chaotic end circle that was. I cannot believe what happened to LG at the very end. Dia, I know you were able to take us through all the action with Rain Day. And now we have our final game on World's Edge before we make that transition into Storm Point. I am still befuddled, Vicky, by what was what what was that end game? Because there were so many ways in which it shifted. I always get really excited talking about Apex Legends. It's why I'm here right now, because I love Apex Legends. But man, do end games like that really get my heart pumping, because there are so many ways to change the dynamic of Apex Legends, and cooldowns are so important from evac towers to wraith portals to swings onto the low ground. Every single, every single movement and cooldown matters so much. And it's cool to watch that play out. Now, Vicky... Why not do it again? What? Did you go next? You got to go next. To be a fly on the wall, to be able to hear Sweet's comms and then Design's comms when he got shot down in the middle place mm -hmm. of that portal. Oof. I know that those comms were hot on the mic. But we go next here for game number three, guys. Man, I also really like the diversity in circles that we've seen so far. Although both circles have now been on the west side of the map. Know that Disguise had that POI advantage since they land in Thermal Station. Furia, who are going all the way down south to Tree. Now happening to see where this next circle is going to be going to. Our final circle here on World's Edge. Last opportunity for those that perhaps are a little more comfortable here to make their mark on the leaderboards today, because once you move on to Storm Point, everything's going to change. The entire dynamic of the map, the picks, the meta starts shifting. Nine Lies again, likely splitting this POI, and Climatizer, funnily enough, has just become two of them. We actually rarely get to see this on contests, but these are two teams that are handling this in a really mature way. Well, it may not be benefiting either of them particularly, Nine Lies 
is not suffering at the hands of meat lovers, nor is meat lovers feeling that way about Nine Lies. The only thing that's kind of suffering here for Nine Lies is the fact that they don't get the beacon blessing that Meat Lovers consistently gets over by Climatizer, which then allows them to get Evil Shield Charge. And if the Evil Harvester appears, for some reason, it's just more than likely appear on Meat Lovers' side. Actually, you can see it right there on the right side. And we get to see where the circle is going to be moving to. Skyhook. So we can expect a heavily congested final circle with a lot of the teams taking up these buildings, but specifically looking at X set where a lot of eyes are on this team to find that success that we all know that they could have but also the fact that this is going to grant them the blessing of their poi so it's a big trade-off i love that you mentioned the meat lovers evo harvester and the beacons that they are often spawning with but nine lies we've touched on this multiple times are just getting priority rotates off of this they move from climatizer and especially in a skyhook zone this should be really evident so nine lies need to pin their entire like idea of contesting of taking away just half the loot on how well they place this game nine lies must come out ahead of meat lovers on the leaderboard for this to be worth it however furia who land over by tree will also have a more difficult time with this rotation than they did last game because they land so far south i mean a skyhook zone is the natural evolutionary enemy of a tree team <laughs> But at least they'll be leaving with the survey beacon scans and the replicator behind them. And with a 19 KP dub, you know that the momentum is swinging. The vibes are high here for Furia. They're going to be able to loot on the way over there as they make their way towards Harvester, which also has a survey beacon and a ring console that they could take advantage of. Aside from the salt bin, too, that they just, just, just get free evil charge towards. And uh, Legacy, with their quick rotate from launch site, they don't really have to worry about them since Furia already had gone for the speed run on this rotate. Yeah, let, let's not forget too, Assault Crates are so crazy because you not only get more EVO, which means that your legend gets better and your fighting capability gets better, but you also get attachments, which means that your guns get better and your fighting capability gets better. You remember when Conduit was being debated as to whether she was worth it it was mostly raven who was leading that charge on hey mm -hmm. we don't like conduit and here's why and a big part of it was because of fight uptime well now being active in fights having legend perks having better attachments for your weapon is just so much more clearly a good measure of uptime in these assault classes Especially with the smart loot that you can take advantage of with these quick rotates too. As you see native gaming on the high ground. G7, at least with the purple light mag, but no scope. So having to rely on that iron sight for the G7. I actually really like that skin there too. And it looks like a team actually just landing right next to them on the middle tower. With so many other teams in the area, LG, and this is what we're expecting from a, a circle pulling towards Skyhook. More of these teams are going to be in that northern side of Skyhook, and other teams that like to play Edge, like Oxygen, are going to be more so poking from afar while relying on probably rotating from that north side without getting involved and putting themselves in a pinch situation. Things to be cognizant of as we look up at, at Skyhook, everybody is going to look at that and go, oh, if this zone is going Skyhook, I too would take the center of it and the high ground. Native, while they have that, you already mentioned don't have scopes. I'll also point out don't have a natural way to sustain without Watson or a lifeline or really any support legend like even a Loba to help get them additional loot from everyone who might drop around them it's going to be really difficult for native to actually sustain this position as a power one into the late game they have to drop they have to take a fight eventually because otherwise you are just standing up at the top of skyhook and bleeding out slowly i love how you bring that up because that also goes into play with how certain teams with their comps play out final circle positioning in early game and what they deny themselves whether it be evil shield charge meds ammo how they want to take those fights and even though you could try to get those placement points right now we got 20 squads left we don't really see that happening until we are down to the top 15 and they're going to be in a tough situation depending on how more of these teams rotate into skyhook with a lackluster spot to rotate in from when they have to drop from that high ground talking about rotates too you can see furia actually taking a look at a team that is going to be legacy who had made that southern map rotate over on the outskirts of countdown 
And isn't it funny that Fury are watching Legacy rotate by them when it's Legacy that should, by all metrics, actually be further behind Fury, who get the first rotate out of Tree, who Legacy was mirroring this whole time. Fury have taken this lackadaisical path through the ring so far. And while they have a good spot in Landslide, they've now been overtaken, meaning they can't move any further into the eastern or rather western side of this ring they can't go through countdown safely and instead have to either move through grandma's house or god forbid the tunnel into skyhook if we do go through grandma's house there is an evil harvester there that they could take advantage of hey. and that's some of those rotates that a lot of these teams are going to be taking note of aside from the evil harvesters it's also a, a, just something that we've seen before where a lot of teams like to wait around those evil harvesters and take a jump on a team that may not be expecting it but for fury here and the evil harvester ahead of them they don't have to worry about that the closest team to them is actually meat lovers across from the train tracks and dno who are flying onto monument but you can see a lot more of these teams talking about tsm are taking their time disguise playing more so by the edge and actually finding this rotate through lava fisher hopefully one of xset's members does not get called out for being a solo south of trials real quick real quick very high stakes fight happening right now nine lives versus meat lovers on the far side of the zone we had specifically called out this matchup because nine lies in order to justify getting half loot getting the worst end of the evo charge have to outlast meat lovers the fact that they're sitting on the same side of zone or rather outside of the zone is not a good look for nine lies who have the disadvantage in a straight up 3v3 they should have prioritized getting a better position in ring and they don't have one and they took their time to make that rotate from the north side of the train tracks where we already saw so many other teams hang out there disguised with the wraith portal to put them into cover designs got that craver in hand and making that quick swap so that way he could give that craver over to timmy who's rocking one of the best bloodhound skins they see that there's a team right up next to them that is rocking that triple take right on the north side of trials is exit that we may note of before so it looks like that member of exit was able to get right back into safety on the high ground of trials while tsm now make their rotate deeper into this next circle dno we saw them flying in over by grandma's house and they're about to take this fight with meat lovers i know meat lovers can fight but can they fight a Gibby, especially with an EMP out first and cracks coming in the way they are from Crust? It's going to be a two versus two until Tech joins, likely healing on the outside. Meat Lovers have an advantage, but a res is surely happening on the inside right now. It's, never mind, Senox full thirsted. Meat Lovers have the definitive advantage. Three versus two, now they just got to execute. But do they want to take this fight looking at a team from in front of them? I believe Moist now looking to get involved. They didn't get the invite in the mail, but don't worry. Better late than never to see what's happening here in the distance. Because by that choke, Nine Lives is waiting there to see if they can third-party meat lovers if Moist gives them that opportunity. Inside of the building, Diamond Gladiators take this fight with Blue Evos. Louis incredibly low, but taking the different angle as his teammate that's right there to get free. Please provide some backup. And the Havocs are just blaring through this lava oh. for the last three games and they keep going tsm get eliminated as they were fighting their way outside of the building nice clutch but that to me was all louis what wonderful management on a caustic of your swings your strafes to take up so much time and deal as much damage as they did in it uh, louis solo or nearly solo saves the lives of Gaiman gladiators in that moment and it'll be well worthwhile since they've got the position on the north end of zone meat lovers though still in a tight spot they expended a lot in order to take this fight against dno still haven't been able to finish it and still have two separate teams looking at them a ones almost gets fried it does have to take a bit of a different angle in order to survive hikes is going to be the same sky needs are coming in and this is looking mighty third partyable just crazy here playing off a little head glitch here too but crazy to say tsm is that first team out of this lobby sends out the nox grenade up to the heavens destroys that barrel what a placement oh. on that nox gas are you kidding me well look at moist sitting pretty Check. waiting to see if they can get some of these kills they get the nox as Duke runs back inside and of course the bubble comes up just in time and now it's shotgun meta baby mnk kingdom with 
Crust dipping back inside. This could just be the timing for a third party. DNO disengaged shortly, but as we called it out, Moist see the knocks happen and come in to thirst some members of Meat Lovers who were left behind. Both teams still alive, but now Moist focusing on DNO. It's a matter of who will last longer, who will get not even more placements for this at this point, just more dignity. Man, Meat Lovers also get to escape with a rat. They send up the Nux. Yes, the Gibby is not safe, even with the PK in hand. Here comes Guild, the Prowler blaring through, and they take control over this building. DNO get eliminated with 17 squads left. Guess it was a good thing that Nine Lives had managed to rotate away before all the chaos happened over by Grandma's house. And Meat Lovers get to survive this. So they picked up at least the 1 KP they got earlier on Senox, and are fine for now maybe a little closer to placement points it isn't great i'm not going to lie to you and say that this is the perfect position for meat lovers but it's a slightly better spot than they had otherwise unfortunately compared to nine lies which is what we're tracking them up against it is very very bad for meat lovers who has a solo now have to outlast an entire trio that had a rotation ahead of them into the zone see what that rat is going to be able to do here as we tune into furia who have completely bunkered down inside of this floor with all the caustic barrels to block out the entrances it's also the information with the amount of teams that are coexisting in each other's building not a whole lot of squads that still have to rotate in. Most people have found a spot to play in skyhook so this zone weirdly enough vicky should actually be a pretty calm one what'll be crucial is for teams that have a little bit of a better idea of where this is ultimately pulling that those teams are able to get their rotations through squads like say nine lies are gonna have to think about moving a little further up north where a team like lg who's predicted things really well i think even include gaiman gladiators in this should have a nice perhaps not relaxed but a nice relatively straightforward rotation to stay in the conversation for the next ring and to at least hold that sliver of cover that the building provides looking at LG specifically because we know that once that next circle closes in all these other teams on the outskirts of Skyhook building see where that circle is pulling it's going to be a bloodbath because there's little to no cover other than the fence line right in front of Gaiman Gladiators and we know that a lot of these teams in that middle building are going to be forced to drop down and then coexist whether it be on the low ground or whether they funnel themselves out into the line of sight of LG. I can't help but smile. I love the way the Disguised are making use of the Wraith right now, and I hope that other teams are taking note. Just the ability for Wraith, like we've already seen Designful save Timmy with a nice portal to get out of the line of sight of Exit. We saw Disguised just now portal into this building, making it a safe rotation, even with so many other squads in the area. They're even able to use it to control two buildings at once, and well, it's a bit of an awkward timing for Timmy, and well, I wouldn't have imagined that's what perfect play looked like for them portal 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 and a shorter cooldown on it has saved disguise multiple times put them in great positions and will likely be a factor a big one in their next rotate why they're the only team rocking the wraith in these na lobbies sticking to it while Furia are playing a much more traditional comp that we've been seeing a lot more often let's jump into a listen with Furia to see how they take this rotate with round four closing in no, there's someone upstairs. There's someone upstairs. We can still play to blow up diner roof. We could just jump in the middle courtyard and it's horrible, but we'll be the only team not fighting. I think there's a team from diner going doing that, but maybe not. Yeah, I think may maybe we jump. Maybe we go and jump, jump over the fence. fence. Yeah, maybe I'm down. Jump over the fence. It's getting up. Okay, just wait. I didn't use it. Oh. Crack right two. One, one. I got something. I'm batting down here. You gotta play for the kills. Yeah, we need these three. I died. Oh, Barrel. Oh, damn. I can't believe they just... Oh, you heard it. They couldn't even believe they got focused on, but they had no cover. There was a team playing from inside. It was even Lucian on the high ground, GKS on the low ground, and DSG still alive with only Design being the last one alive. He can't slide away. Disguise get eliminated in your feed. 
and Gaiman Gladiators controlling not just their own building, but the market to the south of it are the big winners of the western side of the ring, taking out DSG, picking up a lot of KP, and as we already called out, having one of the few relatively straightforward moves into the next zone. It's difficult for a squad like LG to keep Gaiman Gladiators away from the train station, so GG can start rotating in and honestly not be too worried squad like gks can't really say the same these frags are destructive and chaotic has very little hp to work with shielding up slowly lg have but to look at gks the wrong way and we'll be down to eight squads what we didn't get to see, at least in our feeds, is the fact you see the, the scan coming and they see the four hostiles, but I believe at one point, Sweet had gotten down, so leaving LG as a duo to survive inside Ooh. of this train station means that they don't have the man advantage for to actually sway I mean, gladiators who could come in from the other side of the train, and then GKS who have the scans to let them know how many of those teammates are playing from inside. That's a nice call, and the fact that now it's a duo holding the train yard changes everything. Oversleepers will have a lot less to contend with as they have to make a rotate out and to the north, but <laughs> I still wouldn't feel too comfortable doing it, especially without cover of smoke. It's going to make this causticle so important for ETH. Oversleepers have got razor-thin margins to play with, especially when factoring in the team behind them. Oversleepers with the POI advantage and having the slight high ground moist fighting for their lives on the low ground currently. This is the chaos that we were expecting. There are five teams fighting for their life here on this south side inside of this middle building. And Oversleepers are going to be forced to get out from the sliver of cover that this fence line to their left provides. You see, Over is going to be able to pop in that bang. Old slide all the way down. You can see the Rolling Thunder coming in oh. time. Skirt get eliminated. Legacy meet them in the lobby. And Oversleepers with nowhere to go get called out as voices on the other side such an awkward course of events walking straight back into the rolling thunder like they had no choice native now come in for the third party and luxford gets a shield swap in time to stay alive for a few more shots ultimately likely going to go down native have just a knockdown shield to play a sliver of cover ju just underneath this bridge will it be enough sentinels have come in for the third party luda wants to pick up a few thirsts, a few more kills. This is just one for Sentinels so far, and they can look for so much more. Native go down top five for Sentinels. Luda with the Beast of the Hunt activated. No perks necessary here, even though he's about to have purple. Is able to get that cleanup. Zanayo taking a different angle, coming up right behind Moist. Luda gets taken down. Zanayo's won, Ooh. but they find the no, kill. No, 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 no! Moist. No! No! Oh, no. The cast two at the very end. <laughs> That was devastating. That was a really, like, real panic-inducing moment for me. I felt it as if it was my own squad mate, and unfortunately, that's just how it goes sometimes. It does mean that we're down to three squads, and hey, we've talked up Gaiman Gladiator so much during the course of this game. Let's see how they can navigate this, with GKS being the only other three-person team available. LG are still operating as a duo, but if you can just take a few chunks out of GKS, LG could open things up for Gaiman Gladiators to walk in. They're taken to the skies. They are trying Ooh. to line on the side of the map that they know nobody okay. else is on. Wait, I love this. They have now put themselves in a better spot to potentially third party. Last two squads left. GKS get eliminated. Gaiman Gladiators, Louis falling low. They try to swap places here. And uh, Gaiman Gladiators take out the duo that was left of LG. But that was still big because LG was able to finish in that second place spot. Yeah. That change in gameplay from just last round where one critical mistake costs them second to this round where one genius play earns them second with a chance at first. LG definitely have locked things in since the last round and are very, very scary in that end game. An uncontested evac tower should never go off, but when it does, the different position that LG had, if they had all three people up, likely gets them the win over Gaiman Gladiators.
I definitely think it would have. Not only having all three members up would have been important at the very end there, of course, man advantage, but the fact that they had the evac tower on top of the train station too, instead of putting themselves in between both squads, allowed them to then reposition on the other side of the fence line. Even if they didn't get the dub, that was pressure on its own. Now, imagine if Gaiman Gladiators had taken a lot of damage from that previous fight versus GKS, what that duo could have done. But... Not a hero there. Guy Gladiators take the win with 11 KP and with some patient play inside those northern buildings of Skyhook. Yeah, this is going to be a real what-if situation for a lot of teams, but GG can be very proud, LG can be very proud, as can GKS. When we jumped into our listen-in with Furia, it was actually Furia calling out the move that GKS ultimately made, that they should be the ones to drop in outside of the fence line towards the center of Skyhook and make a play that took them through, let's say, the path of least resistance, the one that is a little bit more peaceful. It works out for GKS. They don't get a lot of kills, but a third place finish off of that means a whole lot to this squad that gets to put themselves in top three. Moist do contest that, however, with a pretty high kill game of their own. Yeah, the Grim Griefer is coming in to find the opportunities of third party like we saw in Grandma's house after their rotate from Big Mod into Stacks. Great heavy KP game here for this final game on World's Edge. When we take a look at page number two, Oxygen still finding some of this KP but not getting the placement points that we were expecting them to have, Dio. Yeah, the, the points from kills will help, but this isn't the zone prediction that I talked about in the first two games. And so seeing that falter now, well, it doesn't give us any long-term judgments about the squad does mean quite a bit for their standings in today's games and in the overall exit and tsm actually rounding out the bottom big surprises but something that we'll continue to keep track of is rain day we're coming up on the end of the season and i can certainly imagine that nerves are getting to everyone they certainly are and you could tell sometimes it's those little things that y your adrenaline is pumping you know that it matters and you make a mistake the other hand sometimes you could feel superhuman and i've been seeing some really good in in games from lg they've made some small moments not count but overall this is a dangerous squad if they can keep playing this consistently i think a lot of them sentinels moist they're getting 10 11 nine points each game and that's a really really nice thing to see but someone who knows uh how to do something like that maybe even more it's got their team to sixth place so far in the algs and they're waiting and watching it's a good time to bring in phony to chat with us he's been spending some time checking out the games and now he gets to bring his analysis and his charm to the <laughs> broadcast what's up phony how you doing man yo can you guys hear me just a uh, preface can you guys hear me the yes. deep the deep voice oh yeah we can hear you man hey listen it's great to have you and uh i i kind of want to open it up just uh how has this last little bit been i know we we have you on the show but you guys are sitting in sixth the algs has been great you're looking uh not only you know regional finals qualified but but land qualified at this point talk to me how things have been going on your side personally and with ssg um it's been going good ssg has been training us very well as well um Shout out to my teammates, both Frex and Zainu. I love Zainu a lot. And what we realized was we needed basically Zainu to be on the front line because he, every time he was on Bangalore, he just complained that he couldn't see anything. And, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to him. The dude's probably the best fragger in the world in NA and it may be biased, but he literally just is. And I feel like he could do a lot more on Bloodhound than I ever could. So having on it just makes sense. Um, and then as for Frex, you know, we, we wanted to figure something out because he wasn't really comfortable playing with Bang and I've never played Bang. So we only had a little bit of time. So swapping him to Valk was probably the best move and swapping me to Caustic since I've played Caustic before was probably also the best move. And that's how we basically just came up with our comp. I like that you guys adapted really quickly then to that season 20 changes and, you know, being able to be cohesive of it as a team and staying consistent is everything. But talking about your results so far and the start of the split one season into where you guys are now, you guys ramped up. I mean, were there any hurdles aside from the big season 20 patch that you guys have to really focus on to iron out what you had to do to get even better and to get even more comfortable playing with one another, even though you have history, obviously, playing with one of your teammates? Yeah. Um, it was basically mostly just communication. I feel like we've always had that problem, but, um, when Zainu joined up, uh, he was really like over communicating. He was calming literally everything. Our comms were just like all over the place. So we ended up making sure that Frex lowered down on his comms and just slow down and focus just solely on helping me co-IGO and like picking out places where we could rotate, picking out fights that are happening. And then Zainu 
on the other hand, is basically calling everything, mostly everything, in a fight on whether we should take it or not or whether he believes we should just back off. And I'll just make the final call, you know? As an IGL, I feel like um, it's it's not good to have all the stress on you. So having two teammates that can communicate to me uh, just helps a lot. Now, Phony, this is my favorite time because I've got a bunch of questions for you. And here, I get to ask them when we go over the final circles from the perspective of a professional IGL. So let's go ahead and bring those up because we've had three very different rounds. The first one over by Countdown. We saw a lot of teams stack in here early on. How do you actually navigate getting out of Countdown or whatever you're doing when you're playing in a tight spot like this that has so many teams in the same area? Well, um, actually, they did call it early. Um, they just didn't, you know, aggress on it, but they did call that they had to push British team, and then when they decided to push British team, it was too late. So I feel like if they rushed that play faster, then they would have been able to clear that whole, you know, north side of the map and actually walk in clear. But even even though they didn't call that play, they all, Fun was also calling that there was a solo underneath that they could have looked for. And it was just a comm that was just, like, pushed back because it was just a, such a low comm. I felt like if he would have, you know, yelled that comm more to Nocturno, then he would have made the call to drop, and they would have cleared their side faster to actually play in with Bangalore. You know, speaking of that, I mean, we're talking about comms and communication. You were actually saying the same thing about your squad, that it's about making space for, for the most important calls. So when, say, you're in a position like LG's right here, um, mm -hmm. and you're prioritizing who to focus and, and when, do you have a, a system outside of volume for these things? Uh, yeah, it's basically, like I said, whenever it comes to endgame, I feel like it's best to let the IGL call. You know, it's good to give comms hmm. as like, you know, the, the fragger and everything, but if you let the IGL comm on what needs to happen, then the end game just goes very smoothly. But if you have m multiple people on your team just calling, you know, different plays to do, because I know Sweet wanted to drop right there and he was screaming at Slayer, you know, to do something, but Slayer was worried about something else. And he also burned Caustical on a third party that they did on high, wasted Caustical for end game. And, you know, it was just a... Uh, not just communication, but letting your IGL calm these things and listening to them, you know, it kind of it kind of helps flow the end game better. Now, cooldown management, like you mentioned, so important. I and, and I like the call out on on Costigold. This was another weird situation where we saw survival items almost change the course of this game. Are you a like take two evax one moby do you even pick up a moby how are you making sure that your team navigates the survival items appropriately i feel like it's always important to carry a moby on your team uh i feel like two evax are always worth it i always tell my teammates to drop me the evax so i can place it where i think is best that way they don't they don't ever get confused on where we're going or where to place it you know because i know i know where to place it i know where we're going and I'll, i'm gonna make the final call so they usually just drop me an evac if i don't have it and they'll keep the moby Making sure that you're all on the same page, like, I, I suppose by letting the IGL t keep control, eh, Rende? Yeah, I agree. I mean, and great uh, information on this minutia. We don't often get to see on broadcast or even dive into. Great questions as well, Dia, to dive into that. Volume being the only indicator of, of, the, of the calm difference was funny. I just imagined a bunch of people trying to yell as much as possible. We, we've, we've heard some comms like that before, not going to lie in the ALGS, uh, but it's nice <laughs> that there are a few different ways to distinguish some of it and here you see the standing so phony taking a look what what catches your eye here is their team performing well is their team maybe you're a little surprised at their performance so far um i'm actually surprised that xs is not performing as well as i thought they would i feel like they would they were going to perform i felt like this was their week to perform um i'm not really surprised if tsm not performing well um they seemed very uncomfortable even going into scrims they seemed uncomfortable and I feel like in comparison to DZ, they're not one to like, even in scrims, if they show that they're uncomfortable, then that's probably where they're going to be in LGS, uncomfortable. Um, mm. I feel like yeah. if for DZ, if they're uncomfortable in scrims, they'll, in, in LGS, they'll, Zero will always somehow pull up and show up. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm also surprised seeing Furia doing good. Um, I honestly didn't think they would be first place right now, but they had an incredible second game. Incredible. And this guy's making Wraith work is actually insane. We thought, we told him he was tweaking, but hey, he's making it work. He's making it work. He's making it work. I love it. It's good to see Wraith back in there. And Phony, it's always good to see you on the broadcast, whether we're casting over you, or whether you're joining us here for the halftime, man. Congrats. Good luck with everything coming up with SSG. And thanks for spending your time with us here. Thank you. It was nice being here. See you guys later. And I hope you guys do a good job for the rest of the broadcast. Love you guys. Awesome.
Thank you, man. All right, Phony. Always a pleasure to work with, huh, Vicky? Just a, just a great guy. He's great. I always love talking to Phony. Even after a lot of these LAN events that go down, Phony's a very positive pillar in the Apex community. So being able to talk to him a little bit, especially his thoughts on teams, like he's surprised to see do good. It's always enjoyable to see why. And this, his breakdowns were fantastic alongside with you, Dia. I, you know, I'm surprised you guys keep leaving me alone with IGLs. I, at, at some point, <laughs> they're, they're going to start asking for help. I have too many questions. Uh, well, you, you did a great job as well, and I really loved hearing what he had to say. We've got uh, Twitch drops for you who are watching. Guess what? It's free. It's yours. All you got to do is do what you're doing. Watch. You will get this as long as you have... Uh, we have drops enabled on every single play Apex stream right now, and watching this one means that you will get a free hollow spray. Uh, kind of fuse style. Look at this, fellas. I, I like it. This this was one of my favorite ones. I like the reigning champ one coming up in April. But whatever one you like, whatever one you are interested in, as long as you're watching these hollow sprays for over an hour, uh, these hollow sprays will be yours. So stay tuned, hang out. We got plenty more broadcasts where you can earn yours. Keep stopping by. More Apex Legends action is coming at you. Dia, you had some great questions and so many questions that now we have to give you a break um, in order to just catch your breath, man. We appreciate it, and we'll see you after that in game five and six. Uh, Vicky, it's you and me, though, uh, and we get to kind of start talking Apex in a way. Well, A, first, fun to cast with you. It's been a minute. But B, True. what a day. And we have stakes on it. Like, And I think I love just to kind of get your thoughts on what Phony said, which is, he expected a better day from Xset because they needed it so much. And he also mentioned TSM feeling a little uncomfortable. Have you recognized the, the truth in that? Why, you know, what were your takes on those things? They really love this Valk. I mean, I know Raven really loves the Valk, but I, I'm just, they, they come and perform at the very ends, like when we're sitting on the edge of our seat waiting for TSM to have those results, and they really do perform to the best that they can. But now we're transitioning into Storm Point Rain Day, and if they didn't find that momentum on World's Edge, we know that TSM usually has those games that they clutch out on Storm Point as we take a look at all the three different final circles that we had on each different match day going into storm point here i love this one and it kind of you know makes you see how clear of a pattern a, each day can be and, and uh, although each day is different you look at day three where we had two echo hq endings and on emia we had two echo hq endings that day as well it kind of set the theme for what that was going to be, be about and it really helped to maybe push a few of these results forward for teams who were thriving in that type of scenario. I remember Fury actually took a game off of what we thought would be Xset's win in that match day. But of course, here in on Storm Point, you could see these drop spots. Who do you like uh, and who do you have your eye on here in terms of drop spots, Vicky? What I was thinking about was remember in the early 50-50s of split one for year yeah. four with Legacy and Moist, where Moist came out on top every time, even though Legacy right. would get really close. Eventually, they strayed away and they went to Devastated Coast, which has okay loot. It's not terrible, but when it comes to the rotation points, you have to think about how you're going to be trailing behind Meat Lovers. Legacy being a team that we had to watch to see what they're able to do to maintain themselves within the top 10, uh, top 15. And as we get started, they're going to be neighboring a team like Moist that is just has no problems taking the fight to you, especially with how aggressive that they get playing on the edge of the circle. Well, as we land in to Storm Point, it's time to kick off yet another match in the ALGS. Game four out of six in match day eight. We've got just a couple of days left before we know who is going to land. And that means that you have got to make it count. We transition. And in this way, maybe a team like Xset, who has not had a great start and needs it, will find a way to have a great finish. 10 points, I believe, only at this point in time. And I think the other thing, Vicky, that we don't see here, at least immediately, that you had mentioned a bit about is mill fights or, or, or moist legacy going back at it. When you have these 50-50s, it's different because you can have a team that lands and gets, you know, a purple shield, a blue shield, and then suddenly a great weapon. Here, though, the parity is different. It's more even across the board. You know what you're getting because you're not going to get a purple off drop. It's just not going to happen. You're barely maybe going to have blues, but it's going to be a white-blue fight. And I think that also can, in a way, dissuade people from wanting to take those 50-50s. It's even riskier, but it at least lets you know, hey, we know what we're going to be dealing with on their side and, of course, on ours. 
you know what I don't know what they're dealing with is, is meat lovers that don't go over by launch pad and instead landing by a storm catcher where they immediately took the trident away from TSM to see if they could get the evil harvester as fast as possible and then just dip you saw Verholz actually ping them before they got away so they're going to be taking a, a look at that side and that choke potentially if meat lovers are going to be able to immediately just prioritize their rotation as it does look like that and that means that TSM may inevitably run into meat lovers if they stay there by the edge of the circle gatekeeping that survey beacon on top of Stormcatcher. But overall, Rain Day, seeing the circle and where it's pulling, we've seen a very similar circle pull towards that north choke point in that little small house north of Barometer that leads into Spider Cave, where Skirt is actually right behind right now. And we know that teams that early rotate to that building end up paying for it, especially with the amount of Cossacks that we have in the lobby. That is a good point as well. Notably today, kind of paying attention to some of the drop spots we've had no real repeats no full repeats i believe from anything that we've seen over the course of our match days in fact today even in world's edge that skyhook zone that true skyhook zone first time we'd seen it over seven days of play so it seems like while people are pretty aware of what's happened and, and they're using that information well uh, it might be just a slight difference there and that can be the difference in winning sentinels RKN at the charge with Luda and Zanile right behind. Had a chance to maybe pull something crazy off. Zanile going down to a caustic canister, but they've been willing to fight. They've been getting points off of fighting, and I think they've just yet to put together a full win. This could be it. Gotta see here, since we are on Storm Point right now, there's also so much other possibilities to level up your Evo Shield. You got the wildlife out here between the flyers, the spiders, Aside from the evil harvesters and the bins themselves, Native Gaming, one of the only teams rocking the Seer, by the way. Seer, Bangalore, and Caustic sliding down the kill. But Klain has been making this work, and this is definitely one of those left field legend picks that has allowed Native to work into their strengths, even if it's not the traditional bloodhound that we keep seeing from these other teams. I like Seer uh, on Klain. Vicky, I'm a big fan of that. I think, I know we're not mm. seeing it, but for me, Seer really is uh, very decent. I mean, uh, definitely a character kind of like Wraith. I think actually maybe in a better position across uh, the entirety of the meta to use it than Wraith uh, in terms of the value of those skills are still incredibly valuable. You hit somebody with a focus of attention and exhibit in terms of team fights are really game changing. And when you have a character that when he does the right things can change the game, uh, I think he's always going to have a presence. Seer sometimes, though, in our leagues, just a little bit of everyone's doing it or nobody's doing it, very much like Caustic. And right now, it just seems like most of the crew have gone, yes, he's good, but not quite worth it. Clay going against the grain there. But as people start to fly into Barometer, we know that at least they a lot of players realize they need to do the same thing here, which is try to find a safe spot early. And while more of these teams situate themselves inside some of these buildings north of Barometer, and I like how you bring up the Seer pick, we could also talk about other counter picks, seeing that the fact that there is basically a Cossack on every team minus maybe one team or two teams, which means where have the Watsons gone? Furia yeah, has, is the only, yeah, like Furia is the only one running Watson right now on Storm Point, and it's his Watson, funny enough, that's on the Watson right now. But if there's no Watson, if we don't have cryptos using EMP on the caustic barrels, Fuse is another counter pick that makes sure that your barrels aren't going to have a great time uh, securing those buildings because those knuckle clusters end up being a problem. And especially now that, Seer, that uh, Fuse can run into his own mother load and uh, close in the gap and put in even more pressure. So, so many different counter picks that we haven't really seen NA in corporate versus the other regions that we've been exposed to. And I think that's... Indi indicative of people still trying to figure things out and also it being a little bit more of crunch time in the league. Maybe if season 20 had happened right at the start of the ALGS would be different and we might see more experimentation, mm. some committed um, lineups and then go into counter picks. But I think right now people are trying to figure out what is the best meta. I think Caustic has cemented himself in that. I think Bloodhound has as well. And I think Valk that third character was pretty much Bangalore, but there's really a third swap off that we're seeing on World's Edge and on storm point and so the counters have yet to come i think this is where the regional finals the regional interpretations of these metas vicky is really going to show up in the next few weeks and of course at land because that's where we see apac north typically uh generate more interest uh, in terms of variety variety of the way that they play and watson certainly features heavy there and it features a little bit more in Mia. 
Talk about different legend compositions. The only catalyst that we've also been able to see right now is a catwall has come up from enemy engaging in a fight where they actually ended up backing up and it's LG, but they got the utility out of them. They got that wall up and they were just looking for an opportunity to go for that evil harvester. And it looks like LG did lose out on a member, which is why you see Sweet just backing away right in front of Disguise. Very hard fight right here. We actually saw this last week be become the spot where the game was won. Right now, we know that that is going to be most likely outside. Well, very, very far outside of the zone. So they will have to move. But LG going at it with Disguise, who are notoriously late at rotating. A team we'd mentioned, except up on the north as well, starting to make their way down, Vicky. See so many of the other teams that are sharing some of those buildings by barometer. While well, the fight in Pylon has not stopped. This is Legacy versus Oversleepers. And in the distance is TSM and Meat Lovers, where they neighbored each other earlier on in the north side of the map. This is the difficult rotations that you have when you have such a south pooling circle, literally pulling on the opposite end of where they land by lightning rod. So Legacy now engaging on this fight by Pylon may have an invite to a third or maybe even a fourth party from Meat Lovers. This is a very interesting fight. It's a fight that could take a long time. There's so many ways to delay it and for a solo to kind of be a bit pesky that I think it's it's wise for teams to not over commit here. And TSM, although they are firing back, you can see the Valkyrie missile swarm from Evan and trying to just say, don't mess with us now. As they move in, they're going to run into oversleepers who, despite being one of our, I think in the bottom 20, uh, maybe bottom 10 of our teams in North America overall have had a really good set today and I think are playing like they have some momentum onto them. So TSM going to be wearing on both sides here as they figure out how they're going to try to wrap, whether it's towards Legacy and Furia or towards Oversleepers. To highlight how much better that they've, they've performed at least so far today as the Sentinel shots come out, they're actually in very last right now in the region rain day oversleepers are in third i didn't want to say it unless i was Listen. absolutely sure you know i put them i put them i gave them 10 spots but yeah nobody is safe i'll say it right now uh. and they are in last but this is the ramp up that a lot of these teams need to find that confidence to find what season 20 has brought so that way they could come back again and figure out what they could do to stay on the top end of the overall standings as we take a look again at more of these teams that are taking their time to rotate playing by the edge meat lovers have gone from all the way on the other side of pylon now over by Cedo, and then you could currently see disguise making their way from cascade more of these teams are going to be facing off against each other on that northern choke that then leads into barometer i'm thinking the choke that leads from Cedo Station in between the Spider Caves, which is why I said sometimes that small building where Skirt had taken control of early in the game could be a little risky. But while TSM make this rotate, they already got the Evil Harvester right next to them, but they're being gate kept. Let's tune into a listen with TSM to see how they play this out. You want to cross back? I think we have to cross back and take gas and Valkyl. Can we I, I the bangle? So. Race for bangle. I might die. I'm good, I'm good. I'm in it. There's an extra mech here. There's an extra mech here. Batting, batting, batting. Grab that mech Grab that mech They're getting shot at, maybe? Break this shit. Break yeah, this they're shit. getting shot at. They're getting held out. Break this, break this. Maybe we can third this. Let's go to height. Yeah, they might fight, and we have third party. Okay, I'm trying to see where we can actually buckle. They are getting, they are getting shot and, and held out, though. I think we have to walk up over here now. Okay. Everybody to pop a mech hit and we Valkyl into zone. Yep. Okay. Um, this is my last mech hit. My last mech hit. Pop yeah, a mech hit now. Two mech hits. I can drop you on F3. Pop in one. Drop a mech hit now. I like this decision from TSM. Why? Because in the outskirts of this fight where they were considering third party is LG in Jurassic taking a ring console. And there's GKS that are waiting for LG to finish getting that ring console to then look and poke at the teams that are still fighting like Furia and Legacy. So wrapping around that rock is definitely the greatest move that you could do, especially since you're one of the teams running the Valkyrie. Jumping right over the Jurassic Park fence though. No electricity could maintain them. It's LG that lost on Slayer earlier. Still playing this out as a duo and Funk almost going down with GKS taking some shots at them and Legacy trailing behind them. 
amazing amazing stuff there just to even stay alive obviously they've been down to two players for the last couple of times we've seen them after round three has closed lg but they continue to fight on vicky i think that decision tsm made could be a game winning decision it doesn't there's still a lot to do they're in zone with moist esports now on the back side with no team behind them but the fact that they would have had to get through lg furia legacy and then drop in gaming with the skies probably rotating after that the exact same pathing by just valve ulting and running through zone they avoid all of those teams and now sitting pretty and leave the chaos out there that's the type of decision that a good igl so a, an experienced team like tsm make and that's why they're always even though they only have four points after three games always going to be a threat and that's why you also hear them trying to bounce ideas off of each other too, just managing to see, do we third party this or do we just rotate and prioritize yep. our positioning? And this is what you're avoiding here too, because even if they did manage to get through Jurassic Park and get through that choke, it's a lot of open space and Sentinels is holding the jungle side by that bridge. And a lot of the fighting here by North of Barometer, what these teams don't know is where the circle is pulling. Skirt thought it could have pulled towards that Northern building, that tiny building by Spider Cave. It is not. It is pulling right on top of Oxygen. More of these teams are making the rotate as a circle closing in behind them in disguise they're looking to clean up gks and again close to the barometer circle we saw just a little bit north of it is where it seems like it will pull right now though the action with the havoc timmy realizes even with the turbocharger he's got to make sure he tries to pre-fire that if someone's coming around but the evac tower is a saving grace it's going to be about movement disguised they rotate late we already know that but two evac towers they wave at each other up in the air stay naughty and designful Looks like those coordinated flybys that we see. And one of the things that I love about DSG here is they take an edge and they don't try to fight for more. It's not about God spot. It's just get in, let's stabilize, and let's see what we can get. Especially this late too, when you know so many teams are already gonna find their own buildings and barometer since the first circle. It's gonna be tough to find any space that's left. And Disguise being on that catalyst and having that cat wall on landing from these evex are equally important, but they don't really have a lot of cover to work with once more of these teams circle in, other than the natural cover that the crates to their right provide. I would imagine most of the pros are taking the third piercing spike because that's just so valuable but you know everybody's got a different thing we kind of thought some of the uh certain perks that when we first thought looked good um actually have now seen them though they look good maybe overshadowed uh by some of the more utilitarian ones ones that suit the team and so either way being able now to also kind of get back to the old catalyst after a few nerfs with her level three perks you could just see the raw value of the ability means they can go they can hold the corner they can still be exposed like they were and survive and just buy some time and it's not worth fighting so a good showcase of different legends here in this one right there though a sentinel shot goes in but does presley and scurry fire right back an x set a little bit in trouble they've got a long way to go with 17 seconds left and three teams staring at him including oversleepers I'm hearing a res happen, evac towers coming out of everywhere, evolution flying in without your East popping the beast of them beforehand. So they just save and get the scan instead. A lot happening with this circle closing in. I also saw that Sentinel shot with the gold sight. Mm. Lots of snipers with this new meta, especially talking about the different weapons that have come into play for the meta between the Havoc, uh, the Digis now not being able to be on SMGs, Oversleepers taking this fight, I believe against Disguise, they still have that slight high ground here. And while Oversleepers are out in the open, talking about lack of cover, it's only up to Charmander here to clutch this out. Unfortunate there for Oversleepers, X set. They do more damage than they take, which is huge for them. 10 points after four, sitting in 13th place after three, excuse me, in the fourth. Can they put together a win? Nocturnal certainly going to want that. And with that red Eva eight, it takes a little bit of damage. Man, that range is crazy. Players aren't used to it. An extra 20% uh, is going to happen here, especially on the ultimate. And so Koi trying to fire back and with the wingman Eva eight, it's going to be hard to beat them, but they're getting taken down. My goodness, Oriolis and drop in gaming are putting in work. Can Koi do something crazy? Oh, the wingman's good, but I'm not sure it's good enough. 
He can't capitalize off the rest of Fury is inside of this building, but he tries anyway. Well, he gets pinged from every direction. Koi gets taken out and exit go out in 13th. Nine lives beat them back in the lobby and Disguise are having one heck of a game from their rotate. Now playing off that slight low ground lip. They try to push out from the building here, but Tibby's not alone. He's got design and enemy right there to hold hands with him. Disguise, 40 points, second place, but they haven't had that W yet. We saw it after five, our leader didn't get a win. Disguise, though, have a chance to do that, and then some Furious still on the northern side in front of you with the Watson. They will not have to move for a while. TSM still alive, too, and maybe still in a really good spot with Moist Esports. They're only threat next to them in Oblivion out on, on the outside, but not in zone yet. So Furia, will they have to move? Yes, quite a bit. It's going to be a tough road for his Watson, but you can see up in your left-hand corner, Furia at the very top of this lobby. They're going to have to go all the way south, Vicky. It's easier said than done. How can they figure out this rotate here? Skyward dive? Wow. Okay. Risky. We take the risk. We take the NA Valk Skyward dive. It's very traditional out here for a circle like this. Well, more of these teams are forced to play their hand in this chaos, trying to get into that next circle. Disguise takeout dropped in gaming. They cleared this side for now before they meet up with Meat Lovers and Oxygen Esports inside of the building that they're neighboring. What a great use of it though. Furia seemed to have landed and found a spot. We'll follow that in a second, but Disguise take first place because they're thriving in the chaos. Timmy on red already. You know Timmy knows how to do that type of damage consistently. The man drops 10K games like they're candy. And still finding a way here to find 10 kills, a part of his assist and kill total nine. He's one off. Timmy, oh, hit firing. I'm not sure even he could do this. Somehow he stays alive long enough and it's just designful who's left. It's the fact that it wasn't even the team that he was fighting against was the one that took him down. It was somebody who griefed him over to the side. Moist have the high ground there. They're looking at all this action, and even through the smoke, they're taking those shots with the 30-30 as they try to close in that gap. But I don't expect Moist to give up that high ground that they're holding because I believe TSM, oh, yes, TSM is playing right underneath them. We never had a chance to see this until now, but uh, these are great spots. Great spots for Moist. Not a great spot for TSM, but in terms of getting the job done, they're in vinyl zone. They have a skyward dive, assuming that that is ready. And so it's just a matter of timing when they want to do that. Uh, but they are safe, at least for now. Waltzy realizes where they are, though. And so they might have some grenades. Maybe just going to be wary of it and try to rock, watch angles and make sure no funny business happens. TSM could creep up to the right side if they wanted to. And I believe there's still a slight high ground opening if they really want to take that skyward dive. I'm not expecting okay. that. Bangle. But the bangle could provide that pressure rain day up on this high ground here. And it's going to provide pressure onto Fury who are neighboring that side who are getting sent on by another team. That TSM having a chance to go up. They do. Skyward dive in the air is how Verholz and reps. Where they will land, no one knows quite yet, but we know Furia is on the ground. Second place going back and forth, ping-ponging between them and Disguise. But Furia loses one, and they lose two, and they lose three. Keon is out, and Furia is out as well with five squads left. And that was with TSM landing right on top Ow. of that fight. What? The green light while keeping their backs cleared out from Moist that could shoot at them. They have to hug the wall. Look at this, TSM, there's a Cossack ultimate, and that is just going to take away all of the area they wanted to play. Moist still, I think, in the best position here because they've been on height and they've got cover and no one can push them at all. TSM, I think, trying to go get KP, realizing it might be too much of an uphill battle to really contest against Moist, but it's Meat Lovers, TSM, and Moist in our final three as Gildersons looks to move down. You don't need a Digi. You don't need a Turbo. You got the Havoc here. And you're clearing up this space. He doesn't even have the knock stayed. Waltzy doesn't even have the Beast of the Hunt. They're just frying everybody with these energy weapons. And from Pride Rock slides down Moist to take game number four on Storm Point. Well, when it comes to getting the job done with a god spot like that, you knew Moist wouldn't have an issue. They threaten the rest of the lobby and they pay dues on that threat and I think one of the things that Moist does so well is they don't overcomplicate a situation like that they could have messed with TSM down below they could have tried to get a little bit more aggressive but they just sit with a caustic and they know 
this is our game to lose, guys. Let's just let's just make it happen. And they walk forward with Havocs and finish it. Felt like Verholst flew his Valkyrie in there without even shooting. Seeming like maybe it's I don't really think this fight's gonna go too well, even if I try. It's the fact that they also the talking about Moist, they didn't have their ultimates online for that final circle, and right. they're part of that slow rotating side. So while all the chaos was happening in front of them, no one was gonna look at Moist sliding down. The teams that were playing out in that open field with little no cover, they were playing for second, third place. So that was the risk that they were willing to take mathematically to see if they could get the KP that they need so that way it could make up for the lack of placement point if they don't take second or first. It's been very inconsistent for these teams on who's winning as well, because we have seen a lot of these final zones where people are a little bit battered and bruised. The, the not full teams, not sitting. We don't have this kind of traditional uh, showdown, I would say, where you get a, a fully healed Red Evil squad on one side and then the other thing, the same on another side where they just go toe to toe and see who can out aim each other and out maneuver in the mechanics. But right here, we're seeing one team really in a, a premier spot and other teams thriving in the midst of the chaos before we get there. That's where Furia has really, really shown that they are dominating today. Disguised have also done really well in that without wins yet, but being able to, as a matter of points, and I'm sure we'll see that in just a bit, showcase why they are a team even if they're in 11th or 13th right now overall, that could win it all. And talking about Disguise, this is a team that looked a bit lost on the release of Season 20, going into Pro League for that first weekend last week, and have absolutely been ramping up. Talk about one heck of a game for Disguise. They rotated from North Pad. They got a good amount of KP fighting for their lives from the north side of where that circle was pulling to. And we even saw them land, find a spot, and still clear out that north side of the map that teams like Furia were struggling to figure out where to go without a Valkyrie Skyward Dive. Yeah, and that's starting to show why I think maybe maybe on World's Edge, smaller map, you can't get caught out in the same way you can in Stormpoint. Why Valkyrie was so mandatory in the meta. Why, if, if this becomes more seen and more used and more visible, she might return even more for players as a mandatory pick now. I'm not saying she's fully, fully back, but I do think that, I mean, there's a lot of characters that many teams would have just been dead had they not had a Skyward Dive, had they not had a Valkyrie. Furia, TSM, just part of it. Uh, just two of those teams uh, that have had big, big changes here. But Moist with the win, this is what I meant by the battered and bruised, uh, you know, in terms of teams not showing up full. It's it's a 23-point win, which is a really solid win. It's not a 16.1 where it's a little lower. You get 12, you know, placement points and four kills. But look at all the kills across the board, Vicky. That is really unusual, but it is this chaos that people are thriving in. It's, it's KP kind of focused today. Disguise and Moist took everything from the lobby. 11 KP each of them, while Oxygen get seven, Furia get eight. Very kill heavy for this first top 10 spots here within this game. Really interesting as well. I think that's what's hurting some of these teams who are maybe trying to have a slower pace or not predicting zone well enough. Teams sitting in the right spots and taking advantage of fights and avoiding fights as well. You can see big zeros for four teams in the lobby, five teams, excuse me, not a point at all, not a KP, and of course not a placement. Those start being earned at 15, uh, but really, really unusual to see seven teams out of 20 not have a single kill. So really unusual, Vicky, but also it kind of sets up the tone for today, which is uh, a few teams are dominating and running at squads, and it's gonna be hard to beat them right now in any traditional sense if you don't join that join them yeah it's it's that hot and cold performance from lg from world's edge into storm point it was unfortunate because we do know what happened they one of their thirds got called out in the middle trying to get the evil harvester it was their caustic big hurt box and mm -hmm. in that they had to play that as a duo and then they still rotated through one of the heavily contested rotation chokes for that circle which was jurassic park we saw four teams try to take fights there which is why tsm survived as long as they did and they avoided all that chaos by rotating outside the circle well let's take a second and highlight our winners of game four on storm point moist esports moving from apac south they were the second team to do so and i don't know what it is about apac south in north america genome's taking over the broadcast he did so earlier uh and obviously dark zero and moist they're taking over in a it's kind of a joke but in a way it's not they're certainly incredible and with the addition of gilderson's 
after the old NRG no longer exists anymore and they went their separate ways. MT and Waltzy have found that perfect third. And I think Vicky, man, it has really shown as we look at our series results here. What's your thoughts on that? Because Moist, with that win, find themselves in third place. Third, but Furia still stay on top. Maybe not too much of a point difference between them and Disguise. We need to have this pop-off day, and they are performing to those expectations. Again, 11-kill game alongside Moist, and even though they don't take the dub whatsoever from World's Edge to Storm Point, they still put themselves in the top three with 45 points, but really close even between our top six teams here, top seven. It is a very shocking day from TSM so far, and even though they had a much better game number four uh it, it's still very very low with only two games left it's looking like winning is going to be a very tough task but when you look at disguised and what they're doing i know fury is doing amazing they're putting it all together it's a point difference disguised have as many kills as the fourth place team have total points <laughs> 31 kills 31 total points for oxygen that is a record setting pace right there, Vicky. If they keep that up, I mean, they absolutely uh, may just be setting some North American ALGS records. It's just a matter of time before they get dubbed, right? <laughs> you know, it's not just the KP, that placement. I mean, this is about a reality at the end of the day, but disguise, they always come out to perform and I'm really enjoying how they've been able to keep themselves together with a composition that you're not seeing anywhere else in North America. Well, Furia, Disguise, and Moist, your top three after four, game five and six, coming right up. Welcome back, everyone. The action continues here on Storm Point. What an amazing win for Moist taking the dub, 11 KP in their pocket. Well, we make our transition now to game five, where some of the teams that we were expecting to have fun do as well as they have been so far within this first split deal, not doing so hot. No, it's honestly, it's been quite difficult during today's games to actually get any momentum, especially when the top teams te keep crushing as much as they are. But I've got to shout out a few teams, especially Oxygen, who have kept themselves in the conversation, having one of their last days, actually their last day of the regular season. Every placement point for both Oxygen and GKS to keep them inside of the top 11 teams at the end of this split is so important. It's crazy. That's Group A that won't have any more match days here after today as we take a look at the different legend compositions on our screen right now. The Caustics prevail once again, Dia. But we do have some swap ups here for some of the teams that found that consistency on World's Edge going to Storm Point to readjust to the POIs that they're landing on here. And at this point, it is a very different map. That, and we've acknowledged that in many ways than World's Edge and one that, like you say, with the drops can be a lot more, not just 
punishing in some ways, especially when you've got to go up north, but playstyle defining. Because Stormpoint is such a big map, it isn't like, say, when you're on World's Edge and you play Sky West and you go, all right, well, it's over at Monument, I can still play Zone. In this case, if you're at Echo HQ and Zone's pulling Cascade Falls, I'm sorry, you're an Edge team now. Very, very difficult to actually play Zone effectively with rotates like this. It means that you've always got to be adaptable, you've got to be ready for anything, and granted, from last game, I think I got the sense that a lot of teams were certainly warmed up to it. Especially with those quick rotates that we saw and the rotation options that we also heard from TSM's Listen In, and we get to take a look at where the circle is pulling in. Looks like it's going to be pulling between Mill and Cedo here, right by Checkpoint, which benefits dropping gaming and native that are going to be rotating from Checkpoint. They'll probably have a beacon right there, as well as the evil harvester that sometimes spawns on the south side of Checkpoint. You know, evil harvesters are so fun because not only are they an interesting way of getting you progressively more powerful throughout the game, but they've also introduced an idea of dynamic but optimal rotations. When you have an Evo Harvester that spawns, say, if you're Furia over at Wall, and you've got an Evo Harvester both to the north and south of you, yeah, you've got a lot of options. But if you're disguised and the only Evo Harvester is over by Wall, well, you're going over to Wall now. You're either sending one person or you're traveling as a team. And it's introducing the idea that you either need to take space and cover a lot of ground really early on, or have your rotates dictated by where the rest of the map is placing Evo Harvesters and then adapt to these constantly moving variables. Yeah, because then that becomes the adaptable pathing that your squad wants to take based off of those objectives of loan that Season 20 has brought in. And it's great here, too. We actually saw LG suffer for it in the last game. That's why they were the second team to go out in the lobby. They were on the way to getting an Evo Harvester on the outskirts of Wall. There's no Evo Harvester on the south side. Oh, actually, there is an Evo Harvester on the south side of Wall, so they can at least get that one in the middle of their rotate. But they're ahead of Disguise, who had tried to cut them off before. That's the, those are the plays that I really look forward to, is the ratting on Evo Harvesters. I know that somebody is going to do it in some perfectly clip-worthy way. We've had a few teams try, but it has yet to be just the absolute perfection that I'm imagining in my mind. Now, as you mentioned, LG's rotate, because they've got ring data, it'll be a pretty safe one. They'll be one of the first squads that get into checkpoint through a relatively infrequently used rotate. SKRT, however, a uh, bit of a different story. Do not have the easy move up. Don't even have high ground as they attempt to contest the height of Seto. And instead, we'll have to back away using an unorthodox composition in order to do so. That, my friend, is a lot of rotate. Huh. The Pathfinder makes his presence known once again in Pro League. And that is with Depressly making his way onto this roster here with our Lily taking a step down. With Set Nose trying to take shots at them. It's going to be an elongated fight with more of these teams taking their time to rotate into that next circle too. Talking about the teams fighting over by this north side of... Xset finding himself in a fight here, but at least with fun being on this Cossack, they're going to be able to secure the inside of this building. It's Evolution that are outside here with the smoke covering their backs. They maybe want to get this Wii, man. You don't want to just leave that there. I'm just calling for Voodoo to take it. Honestly, I get it. Sometimes I see a wingman, I'm like, you know, it's not my day. Somebody else grab this and Evolution get to coordinate that on their own time, given how much pressure they put on to Xset. Now, with the way Voodoo is making it work, they should be able to even take some of this building. The Rolling Thunder a bit preemptive for Evolution, but a stick onto Voodoo changes everything. Instantly forces out the Caustic Ultimate. Voodoo is still doing a lot of damage here, but needs cover from the rest of the squad. That was such a huge answer from Voodoo to send out the Nox gas before popping the shield bat because he knew that they were going to definitely send it on him the moment that they saw that they got the stick with the arc star. But they're backing away from the low ground. Exit gets some time to breathe for now because they see that there's another team in the distance <laughs> that are just waiting the third party. <laughs> you, you start walking up to that building as Evolution, and it is absolutely occupied. Playing on the low ground is not what Evolution would have imagined in their perfect scenario of how this checkpoint play would go. But given that you've got Caustic, it's actually not a terrible place. These buildings are really difficult to hold, yes, but it's arguably an even more active spot since more teams will have to move in from the south side of the map. And Evolution could collect a few KP off of that with the wingman they got. Especially if they try to gatekeep from the spider cave side too. 
I would just see there's already nine teams that have rotated into checkpoint, sharing the buildings that we just saw right now while LG's looking below to see if any other teams are going to rotate from the armory side. Exiting out of Cedo or Cascade. So many teams like Fury and Meat Lovers that take their time to rotate into that next circle will be coming up across that armory. So with LG now taking a step back and looking at the teams that have height, they could get pinched here if they don't find a building soon. Yeah, LG's spot right now is very timing dependent. It's good in the early game, it's bad in the mid game, and it's good again in the late game. And varying between these things of how powerful your position actually is is something that LG have to be really aware of based on the number of squads that are around them. Furia start to move in right behind Oxygen and that I think quite rightly prompts an additional rotation. There's no reason for Oxygen to fight right now, especially when Furia are in such a roll. And you can very easily tell that it's them because as your guys already talked about, Watson is the only one with the Watson. <laughs> And full purple Evo shields too on the way of this rotate. So they've been going through those Evo harvesters like candy and taking a look at the circle. Look at the amount of teams in checkpoint right now. Sentinels is about to invite themselves to the party playing on the edge of that northern choke. But then they may want to rotate all the way around because we saw that as a sneak peek where the circle is pulling over to the south side. The fight continues on over by Cedo and it is nine lies that come out and take out Skirt. Valk stocks just skyrocketed for the teams that, that predicted that this would be pulling into checkpoint and now are going to find out that they're wrong. In fact, very few squads are going to get advanced access to that information since that's gate kept by ring consoles that almost no one in checkpoint has access to. Gaiman gladiators will find out right now, or almost go down for it, that they've got an excellent position in zone, but a lot of other teams will be waiting to adapt to this information. But Vicky, weirdly enough, this, uh, this has actually already happened in the ALGS. We've already had a zone in North America that looked like it was pulling into checkpoint, then pulled into Cedo. And the teams that have done their homework are really evidently on screen right now. Gaiman, DNO, and Nine Lives are all sat in Cedo Station, knowing that this is likely to happen again. So few zones are in checkpoint. It's a miracle that a lot of teams have actually prioritized it. The mix up on the circle, you already know it's going to be an absolute bloodbath in this next circle. They do lose out on Louis. They're going for the res, trying to prioritize that. But these 30 30 shots are putting in the pressure that they need while Furia now make their way into Cedo and DNO are overextending. They're just going to be sitting on that northern building on top of Cedo and wait for the other teams in checkpoint to make their way into the chaos. Beast of the Hunt does let you freely harass through the smoke, but with the rest of the team so far behind, TSM aren't able to secure any additional kills. Instead, what they're getting is priority on a rotate into checkpoint when checkpoint isn't even the spot the zone is going. Meat lovers attempting to escape don't have a lot of mobility tools to do so, but this bang ult will certainly help. TSM will likely have to give up the fight, starting to focus on how they'll get to the south. Their other option, of course, a Valkyl for TSM that actually could work out quite well, even if they're to take checkpoint and then find out that they've got to leave. At least they, unlike so many other teams, have the ability to do so. And not getting caught in the fray, too, even though Meat Lovers is shooting at them from behind. You see reps dancing along the 30-30 shots. Waiting by the rock side here, though, they may try to go for the Valkyl with the slight lift if it could cover this ground here. But while they back up in time, it's about getting information while keeping up this rotation. Disguise is on the east side of checkpoint, but they're not going to try to fully extend into that next circle. If they do wrap around completely around the rock and they see where that next circle is pulling and they have that information, they are going to have a way easier time in that rotate versus all the other teams that are just congested inside checkpoint. Since the zone is starting to close in, there's a good chance that TSM fight again anyway, because a lot of teams are being pushed together. Teams like Legacy even, going up against Oxygen Esports on the other side of this, are going to be battling it out in Cascade. Zone 2, still one that you can rotate through, but it is a little bit more punishing, and there's a lot less wiggle room for how you'll play this out. I think that Me Lovers is still trying to go all on the other side of TSM. They're trying to out-rotate TSM here. You saw the scan go out from Hell. 
He's trying to see where they want to go next. You see Revs pinging right in top of the choke point that Meat Lovers is currently in the middle of rotating to. And with them being right behind them, Meat Lovers are going to get to the circle first. If they use that EMP, if they have it, oh, they are. It's going to delay this rotate, but to delete the drone immediately afterwards. And TSM are looking to take this fight by the choke here. Defensive EMP doesn't even work. And now Crypto doesn't really get to be a legend for the next 30 seconds. Fortunately enough, with the zone doing the work for them, Meat Lovers survive another encounter with TSM. They unfortunately rotate straight into Legacy and you cannot curse this team any more than they've already been throughout the course of this round. Match five is just not for them. Tech is gonna fall. It's two down for Meat Lovers. One rat is left. TSM sitting pretty saying, well, we weren't the ones to try to counter rotate fast and it actually paid off for them. Yanya was looking to see if there's anybody else in front of them. He got caught by the rock just ever so slightly, but it's fine. Off of the evac, they are going to be able to get deeper into where that next circle is going. Legacy being one of the teams to benefit off of their slow rotate. And now right next to Oxygen. Remember, uh, Legacy pushed Oxygen into this position, then went up north, and now are back to harass Oxygen again. It is so clear that Oxygen do not want to fight Legacy, but Legacy just keep showing up at their door, whether it's intentional or just a honestly passive act of mirroring which it very well could be legacy are finding themselves in a spot where they're bleeding out a team that continually is trying to run from them this should turn into a couple kp for legacy in the next few minutes but with disguise flying in right above them maybe a wrench gets thrown into those plans as many will be disrupted over the course of the next minute everyone's starting to rotate right now Oh man, this guy's had taken an evac tower to get out of checkpoint too. This is where we're gonna see all the squads dwindle down. Legacy losing out on Nizu earlier on. 19 squads still left here. As Hawadis tries to take the side of the building, he gets pinged by another team exiting out of the bunker doors behind him. They clean up the KP that they need to go in for the evil shield swap. Slow down slightly by the Bangalore ult, but thankfully, at least with some smoke that he could use in the next 15 seconds, they could get into cover underneath these buildings. Next few seconds could be deadly for Jaguars, though, and yes, they are. TSM rotate in behind them, and that's going to be the end of Legacy. One member left, one lone member of Legacy, and caught between so many teams. They are out, so are Sentinels, and the ring is going to claim many more lives before this finishes. There are still not enough squads inside the next zone, and so little space and checkpoint left for anyone to play. Another blessing for TSM on their rotation of options and it's just been amazing to see it play out xset a team that everyone has their eyes on right now still rocking full blue evos but they have this feared side as they try to rotate right now into that next circle they're about to meet up with lg and guess who's gatekeeping both of these teams it is oblivion who have not moved from the inside of that cave Normally, the low ground is uh, is not good, but when you've got two teams in front of you, you should be able to third party effectively. Unfortunately, dropping Arcology early changes this dynamic. Oblivion are now weak on the low ground, and everybody is going to start committing into that area to be the one, ideally, that comes out on tap, that sort of last squad standing. Next set first, have got to clear their backs, do pick up a few kills here, and we'll get shield swaps as a result to give them a little bit of temporary HP, even if it's over their current evos. Will Oblivion bunker up inside? Now down their watts and down their big defensive tool, they likely have to give up the space because Xset are not gonna stop for a duo. As they creep up here, close in on the door. Oblivion looking to their backs. They are playing at the evil shield disadvantage here. Nice scan to also give them enough information. 12 squads left and Oblivion need to capitalize in the next 25 seconds before the circle closes in and Oxygen just get right behind them. Exit don't have time to flirt with danger. They've got to commit. They've got to ask danger on it. Day and Nocturnal is doing so now. Sliding on four, takes down Akimbo. And now popping the heels. Just needs to clear out a few Watson fences. Koi should be able to do that for them. Fun right alongside. They've still got an evac tower in the toolbox for Exit and just one member of Oblivion left ratting things out behind them. Smoke will cover them on the way out and Exit face down their next foe, Oxygen, who have survived the gauntlet of Legacy and TSM and Disguised all rotating in alongside them and currently hold just underneath the rocks leading into Zito. 
And now the skies are going to be forced to drop down. Popping Beast of the Hunt. Right underneath them is TSM. They know they send out the Thermite. Stop them from trying to out-rotate them. Timmy trying to play off the rock, but they're getting shot from behind too. And just like that, Disguised melt in the water. So many angles on them from Sito to TSM on the opposite end of this small bank of fresh water. X that and Oxygen are still fighting, giving TSM the opportunity to third party and throw a wrench into Oxygen's plans. They could kill two separate squads here if TSM timed this right. That was the solo from Oblivion that had pressure disguise from behind blinker griefing timmy after getting cleaned up from tsm but now tsm out in that slight opening they really only have the rocks to play off the lip from and they know the exit is to their right if they show their face they're just gonna get beamed by oversleepers who has them in their line of sight and moist who's behind oversleepers that have that height if you told me that going into this game with the way that Oxygen has been pushed around, bullied by so many squads around them, they'd be sitting in the dead center of the next ring. At this point, I, I would have called you a liar, but with Exet right next to them, who's to say whether they survive? Well, I'll tell you who, it's going to be Exet. So let's jump into a listen in with them and see how they approach the next ring. Just throw the boom down. They're, no, they're definitely just going to Valkyl. There's no way they don't. I careful, careful, are, careful, 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 careful. I don't think careful. they have the room to Valkyl. Like, okay, okay. They have no room to Valkyl. Like, if they have Valkyl, they're just getting it canceled, I think. They're they they can play behind the truck. They, they can, can, they can, they can. Enemies here. Just get ready to pop the balloon. Oh, get pop the balloon. Okay. I'm popping it now. Okay. They're fake. They're shooting it. We should take. We should take. Oh, they broke oh. it. They broke it. Okay, they broke it. They broke it. We, need to, we need to fight right. We need to fight right. I'm gonna bang all left and we fight right. Yeah. Okay. Baiting. What do you fucking want? They're close, they're close. I'm bumbling out. There's an armor swap on the right. Possible thing. Yep. No text, no text. I'm with yep. you, I'm with you. How, can you tell me where they are, Koi? I don't know where they are. I'm seeing them. Yeah. Kill, 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 kill. kill. Oh. Wait, we can play corner, we can play. Yeah, yeah, we're doing, we're doing. Left side, left side, left side. Yep. They pop up, they're gonna swing. They play to me, play to me, play to me, play to me, play to me. There's me, walk back in. Walk back in, walk back in, walk back in. On me, on me. Running, 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 running. I pop cells. I need to pop a bat. Oh my god, I'm one shot. I need scan. Okay, okay, I'm scanning. Okay, left as well. Runner left as well. I'm dead. Fire shooting, hold shield. Walk forward, walk forward. Fuck you, right? X center on the ropes, but they're still surviving with this smoke. Oxygen and TSM both pressuring, but which one will commit? Will anyone? TSM are slowly bleeding out X up behind these rocks, and somehow, miraculously, TSM have cover. Texan has nowhere to go. They really only have the smoke for some natural cover, and they are praying to hide behind this mobile respawn. Look at what Noct has to work with. He pops the bat, but he's stuck in between oh. Oxygen. It was just a matter of time before both of these teams were able to collapse on them, and now Oxygen are coexisting alongside TSM by the Rock. Now, TSM and Oxygen should not be able to live with each other. This is sort of a one cannot live while the other still survives situation. And TSM know that as well as anyone. Looking at Oxygen right now, they've already got a knock in the kill feed and should know that it's the squad just ahead of them. Verholst takes to the height, cannot overswing this, however. So many squads are looking at this. Everything for TSM hinges on this rock. This little bit of cover between them and Oxygen. It's just free range for the team shooting at them from Cedo TSM. Take out Oxygen Esports, our four last remaining squads right now in this final circle. You got DNO still alive, TSM, Furia, and Nine Lies. And of all of these teams, TSM should be the last one that has to fight. With Furia, Nine Lies, and DNO all on the opposite side. No catalysts in this lobby. No way to separate yourself for just a little bit of breathing room. The zone is the one thing that will force all of these squads together. And Blazer's got a fantastic position, but it's still not one that's going to age particularly well. Just a gargoyle hanging out on the high ground before he's forced to drop down. To the team right in front of them. No turbo on the Havoc. He gets beamed, having to hide behind the fence line to his left. So we TSM that know exactly the squad that's hanging out on the other side. Call in a Moby for what it looks like here for some extra cover. It's going to be crucial with all these teams looking at TSM here. Black Hole activated. The Nine Lions actually trying to go in. They actually try to push on TSM. This could grief both of these teams and be the green light for Furia. 
There are so few horizons in the lobby, but just the last one standing ruins DSM's game. Nine lives take them out. Well, they've got a bit of cover themselves. Don't have the manpower to fight. Instead, Furia down to just one. It's going to make this a real chaotic endgame. Watson popping a bat behind knockdown shields. Left to attempt a third party off of the back of this. Gets the shield back. Immediately drops them again in a two versus one scenario. And the melee is going to be enough as nine lives go down. Watson comes in in the final 1v1. And Watson clutches game five for Furia. Are you kidding me? His Watson! Another dub for Furia. They took game two and they take game five. What an end circle that was. Nine lies. They opened the floor to Furia. They gave that to that, Furia. That, that is just a situation. I mean, nine lies played really really well to take out another team turn it into a good spot for them but at the end with how chaotic that got that is a moment where at the end of that match the second and third place teams can just put down their controllers their mice and keyboard whatever it is and say you know what that watson was just better that's just what happened in that end game scenario because it came down to a series of 1v1 clutches and Watson had it in him, but man, was that an exciting end game to watch. And with so much attention on the north side of the zone, I'm really amazed that there was even a horizon left in the lobby to do that to TSM. It's the one legend that could have actually changed the fight, and it did. And they close in the gap, and they capitalize, fully collapsing on TSM at the end, giving Furia the ability to have that entire south side exiting out of Cedo free range so they just were able to waltz in and we did see the pressure come up for furio that's why his watson was the last one alive he managed to pop that bat behind the knockdown which is what came in clutch to find those individual 1v1s whether it be between the valkyrie to his side or the gibby at the very end playing on the back end of that moby you yeah. I, I it is really amazing to watch the way that the legends interact in that end game but like you say just a little bit of clutch play a little bit of nice navigation and knockdown shields makes all the difference you know interestingly enough who wouldn't have gotten taken out by horizon ult is furia because they have watson they are probably <laughs> the one team that would have been safe from that and just it just didn't go that way just didn't go that way i do want to shout out as well oxygen playing that really well uh despite them getting sent on by tsm which is a good play from both sides oxygen survived a lot got to a good place got a got a few kills should still be keeping themselves high up on the leaderboard our overall standings after that match are ready here, guys. Furia take the dub, but nine lies top three <laughs> with 16 kills. A team that was in 24th in the overall standings in NA just had a 16 kill game and a third place finish. I love you, Laser. I love you, Nasty. And I love you, Awoke. These. These players have been so positive throughout the entire experience of coming into Pro League. And let's not forget, this, these are teams that made it in through the Pro League qualifiers. And in Nine Lies' case, made it in by points. They are exceptionally talented, but talent is so often not enough to take you with, through from the challenger circuit into Pro League. With plays like this... It's clear that they have aged real well throughout the course of Pro League, have learned a lot, and are ready to play at the highest level and dominate it. Now, the rest of the lobby did fall a little bit further behind. That's it. That happens in every game of Apex Legends. Teams like Oblivion, Disguised, LG, barely missing out on the top 10, where Evolution, Sentinels, Legacy, and Skirt all ended up in unfortunately that zero point position legacy managing to fortunately pick up at least three kills before that and taking a look at our top three teams the results after that game alone furia come out on top 2.7 k damage nine lies with 5.2 thousand damage is crazy each of these members of this team just went off in that game alone dynasty specifically 2k damage and then dno who called out that circle by the way while everybody else had it wrong in checkpoint they were one of the only teams sitting in that northern building over by Cedo Station. Let's take a look at the kills from this last game, or rather from the course of the day. Timmy still 
on top with Keon and Watson following this up. I mean, Gladiator's actually showing up here as well. And it's interesting to see how we've actually got a lot of teams that show up multiple times. It totally makes sense, but it does mean that these these folks are working together. Timmy, Enemy, Designful all showing up here, and Keon and Watson, the premier duo of Fury, paired alongside Mad Madness. It's so clear that Keon and Watson are always on the same page. It comes from a long, long time of playing Apex Legends together. It also shows you how consistency really reigns over of just putting in a new person on your team and making sure you could grow together to figure out how you could synergize because Feria, they're doing it now when it matters the most, taking first place now overall after their performance in that previous game, taking two dubs in the day so far. Can they take a third is a question with 33 kills right on top of this guys who have 31 total kills. Crazy to see this so far, Dio. We got to see with one more game left. Can't wait. That's going to be on the other side of this break, guys. You don't want to miss out on the action. Welcome back everyone to match day eight. We are about to pop into the last game of the day, but before we do, I want to take a second to remind you all that the Challenger Circuit is running right alongside the Pro League. In the most recent week of the Challenger Circuit, we want to give a big shout out to our top three teams, Barragoat AS, who have secured themselves now a spot in the Pro League Qualifier, LC and CCE Ushinix, who came up right behind them. If you want to check out the Challenger Circuit for your chance to compete and rise up like Nine Lies have through the course of this split, you guys can go ahead to battlefy.com slash ALGS and sign up to eventually make your own way to Pro League. Although, I'll be honest, Vicky, personally, when I'm watching these games, I'm not sitting here thinking I'm better than anyone. I'm sitting here thinking, wow, I'm sure glad I don't have to play against them because they are terrifying and they are going to get even scarier in the final match of the day. Dia, it's about being the titan yourself, especially when it comes to this final game of the day. Gotta take in the reins versus these legends right now because this is where it matters the most, especially for the teams that have this one last shot opportunity to put themselves on board, specifically the teams from Group A, which will not have another match day after today. And as we take a look at all the Cossacks lighting up our screens here, yes, Classics everywhere, but it's the fact that these teams are sticking to these legend compositions, even Legacy with Mizul being on the catalyst would be interesting here too. I'm not too sure if Skirt are actually committing to the Revenant. We're gonna have to see that too, because I mean, we did see them with the Pathfinder earlier. Uh, game six, it brings out the best and the worst in us, Vicky. Everyone wants to try something. And if your strategy so far hasn't worked, sometimes that just means pulling out Rev. Because, I, I mean, as many of us will know, playing Apex Legends regularly, Revenant can be incredibly powerful in the right situation. We don't tend to see it nearly as much in pro play, because 75 health in pro play off an ultimate, 
doesn't mean nearly as much as it does in ranked when you can swing somebody alone pretty reliably. Here, it's a lot more difficult to coordinate an isolated swing onto one person when a lot of teams are practiced at covering each other. What? <laughs> This is uh, a heist. I, we're taking, we're taking the trident, and the trident is uh, is gone. Meat lovers don't get it. TSM get lightning rod and the car, and meat lovers have white shields and a dream. Uh, Verhos just thugged out that trident right underneath meat lovers. I can't believe he <laughs> got away with that. off the rip. All right, that's definitely one way to start our final game of the day. As meat lovers are just gonna have to. Uh, run down the hill. No trident ready to go for them. And uh, Verhos Verho saw that in the last game, by the way. It's just it's such a weird power move. Like, TSM already have Valkyrie. They don't actually need... The, the trident is a more dangerous way for them of rotating through the map. But you know what? They, they, they get it. They deny an advantage to another team, which I will give them as a tactical uh a tactically beneficial play it will mean the meat lovers have a slightly slower rotate and they should get storm catcher and all the benefits there with ring console survey beacon evo cache everything and then be able to make their way into a zone that is pulling us really far up north and it's time vicky for us to talk about this zone because while we've got a lot of teams making their way into it it is going to be really, really far north, which means that teams like Disguise that already land at North Paddock will have an advantage, as will squads like Furia who land over at the wall. Furia, by the way, who have already had a really good day. Skirt is really taking their team name to another level here. And, uh, and with a very interesting comp, I mean, Every man for themselves when you see the Vantage and uh, Revenant coming out, at least in my own ranked games, and it looks like we are going to be able to get that ring console thanks to that perk that you're able to get with the Vantage now with the Blue Evo. But having that information south side of Barometer means that they know that Oxygen is to their north side, so they're just going to get right back into the Trident and skirt their way into where they see the circle is going to be pulling, which is, by the way, Dia, that north side of Launchpad could easily pull more so towards Launchpad, but it could also pull towards those bunker rocks that you currently see LG rotating into. Yeah, LG, white shields, not fantastic right now, but they're sacrificing their early Evo for a better rotation, a spot that can actually not only put some pressure on Disguise, but hopefully share space with them. That's what you want in the long run as LG, because getting into the north side does come at a premium. Everyone else will have to fight through a lot of open space and... Even when you're running Bangalore, that can claim a lot of lives. GKS's position, perhaps a little bit less wide open, but also really active. GKS having blue shields is great, but from a spot like this, should they choose to actually lock it down for the long term, they're going to need kills to go alongside this. Mm, that's what we just started off with having the 2x4 on the G7. And... The only issue here with this position, as early as it is, is you have to consider all the other teams that are going to be rotating from Down Beast and Mill. Evolution, Sentinels now, meeting up with one another on each end of the rock. Your reset already popped the Beast of the Hunt. They see them actually trying to navigate it around the horizon. After getting to be a knock here on the other side, actually just getting the scan on the other side of the rock here, Y gets beamed, so he's forced to back away and pop this shield back. The fact that we're contesting this in a 2v3, though, li li little bit sus. Sentinels don't actually have the resources or the numbers to fight EV Lucian. So them actually trying to fight at all is only delaying a rotation that's already scuffed. We'll see how Sentinels manage to survive. It has not been their day so far. And honestly, at this point, Sentinels can't really afford to have one that isn't. They're in 21st place in the overall leaderboards going into today, and you've only got to be 22nd in order to drop down into the relegation and have to fight things out in the Pro League qualifier. Makes things a little bit tricky here and puts even more pressure on their shoulders while they play that out as a duo. LG with Sweet shooting down the Prowlers here. They can get some extra evil shield charge, and they do need it here looking at the double whites that they're still rocking here. 
Nemesis and Havoc in hand with double energy. They see a team landing right on top of them, and these are the bunker areas that we were talking about playing off the low ground of where this next circle could be pulling towards. One of those awkward situations where you kind of miss the old Evo system where you could trade off shields. Sweet will be able to have so much more presence on the map than anyone else because he's Bangalore, where Slayer and Funk do just kind of have to bunker down since they don't have the adequate mobility to push out, take a few fights where they can. Eevee Lucian back off once again, largely playing the open space, but have taken down Luda and get to continue farming kills, as it's evident they're doing out in the area near downed beach this won't be in zone for too much longer at which point evolution will eventually have to contend with a team like gks or make their way up through checkpoint which i much prefer since it's got a survey beacon and plenty of ways out through it looks like they may be trying to fully contest gks with the ring console overhead and while we do tune into mm -hmm. moist they're the ones that have the option to go right for the third party behind nine lies who went through the rotation point by spider cave up closer to sentinels that they have not stopped this fight the moment they saw sentinels weak playing that out as a duo they want to fully capitalize and they get the final kill onto rkn sentinels the first team to go out in our final game here this will mean that sentinels as we said, already in a tenuous position on the overall leaderboards, have only one day left to rectify that. It would be a big surprise to see Sentinels drop so far down. They've got to play through the P the PLQs, but it's honestly the situation that we're looking at right now. It's a very significant possibility. Oxygen, as they've made their way today through in the opposite direction from a middle tier, almost playoffs qualified team to with several great positions one that can feel actually pretty safe in their sense of going to playoffs is missing one right now one bad game could push them a little too far down the leaderboards and make it all the riskier as to whether they actually qual into land or not so much to talk about here, looking at the teams that are now still making their slow rotate into that next circle. TSM being one of them, probably on a trident, exiting out of wall to go for the north side of the circle. LG have not moved from the spot. The flyer was taken from him. It's fine. They still have the Prowler Nest right in front of them. They just do not want to get called out in the middle of this Prowler Nest because it is Oxygen and Oversleepers that are looking at them from the Armory side of things. I don't mind LG playing this space long term, especially since the zone is likely to pull further north in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, turbocharger just on the floor for me. So sweet. This is this is a wonderful place to be, especially now that LG are all on blues. TSM with a bit of a predictive approach. Did have the opportunity to grab wings, ring scan by wall, but will instead play in the open ground, not wanting to share space with squads like Xset that have already put themselves out on the northern fingers of North Pad. And that was off of the Skyward Dive too, so they got a little bit of a scan to see where the other teams around the area are while nobody's going to contest them or give up their position while they hold that boulder in the ocean. Legacy engaging in a fight here too by Cascade. They take down Scurry right behind the rest of Skirt. We're playing inside of the building. Depressly actually manages to hide in the corner. Legacy just continuously moving along. They don't have a Bloodhound here, which is huge when it comes to finding that rat that's still alive. I can't believe they missed that. I mean, that means banner recoveries. That means heals. That means you can even actually, as Skirt, go down south of Cascade and pull off a whole res before Legacy are any the wiser. They're already starting to path down, though, so keep your eyes out. If you see any pings, and we do, on the last remaining member, Hambino does go down once again. Getting in the trident is not oh, no. the move that uh, we oh. perhaps thought it was, and Skirt do go down unfortunate for them oh bumper car is in that choke it couldn't get through it was too thick as nine lies on the high ground 18 squads left after saying goodbye to skirt taking this fight over on the north side of checkpoint up on the high ground they see the team that's right next to them they jump off of the evac tower to take control over the roof nice scan here and before they drop down, just trying to see if they can hold a different angle. I love the different angles that we're seeing from Nine Lives. They are playing this amazingly so far. Remember, if any legend can do it, Horizon can finish a fight. Watch the use oh. of the ultimate as a Wope goes down. Nine Lives 
Gonna have to get a little bit panicked now as Nasty even almost falls. Senox really doing a lot of work with the Mastiff, and in comes the third party from afar. We may not even see a black hole to close this fight out because other squads will do it for you. Uh, Moist coming in at the perfect time as they usually do. Waltzy gets that knock onto Duplex. And now it's a matter of cleaning up on aisle three. Nine lies, surprisingly, still alive even after that initial engagement. That's just a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I Moist just walk in and clean everyone up like that. It looks so simple for them. A few cooldowns expended, yes, but it is by no means the end of the world to be down a caustic ult. It will be a little difficult, however, to coordinate the next rotation off of this. We're expecting evac towers from here. Crust actually thinking about taking one and Moist more than ready to try and beam <laughs> off of the evac tower as they do now. Will Crust survive? He's on the Gibby. He's literally <laughs> two shot, basically. He gets away in time and gets out of the scary hands of Moist. So that's two solos that we have to work with here. Nine lies and DNO. Legacy still up with the horizon. Now that nine lies have been taken down, they are one of the last ones. And they find the only team they could have possibly engaged with that easily. Oxygen, who were immediately booking it out of the armory. Account wall expended too, a little bit odd for Legacy, but it does keep other teams from effectively firing at them while they pushed up here. And it'll mean that they get at least a few more KP before ultimately having to find their way into cover. This cat wall expenditure though does mean that the oxygen fall, though a few kills go their way, you no longer have a lot of safety as Legacy to move in towards the next zone where Oversleepers will actively gatekeep you. As soon as they just retreat right back towards the armory, huge cracks coming in here. That disruptor hey, ringing in my ears right now. They do Ooh, lose out on one right him. now, but he, he is him. And he's trying to, even playing off the low ground, playing off the lip, still finding some more of the suppressed fire. Hey, ones still clutching this up. Has tech, has hikes, has already taken down two. And with Verholst being forced to run away into the arms of another, we've got nothing left for Verholst to do. Survival is the only thing. Nice clutch up by A1s. It doesn't even look like he has a bat. He just had to pop a shield cell. He at least popped the med kit, but now the circle's closing in and the pressure is on leaving TSM as a solo. Matching that with DNO, who is still alive, by the way. Legacy playing this out as a duo, and the Nox grenade to grief them from below. Moist esports are overhead, and you can see the way that they're playing this space with confidence. Kraber in MT's hands. We've seen this before, Dia. Maybe no trick shot here. Nice. <laughs> Finds the knock on such a Another one! Finds the crack afterwards. Hasn't actually found the rest of the kills yet, but the fadeaway Kraber shot as well has Moist engaging with two different teams. That is not something you see every day, but balancing Legacy and Oversleepers, MT is gonna go for another shot. Wait for it. He's getting into position. Oversleepers are playing right underneath them. They do hear the rat right next to them. Actually taking a look at him. Oh, ho, ho, you think you've escaped from Moist Grasp. It is the solo from DNO that falls to Moist eventually. Now with 16 teams left, the Jaws of Fate are closing in on these squads. I want to take a look at our map when we get a chance because Furia right now sat in the spot that they prioritized super early on we'll have to move soon and take a look at who's in the next zone who's in the best spot exit still placed all the way at the far end of the north pad finger have god spot is a team that need to perform today they've got to be the focus for this last match what a way to go out here to furia a game win away by the way from securing an extra point, an extra bonus point, which would go so hard here for a team like Fury who are ramping up moist from the skies, land right on top of Exit. You talk about having to perform. Exit now being contested by moist who are fragging out. TSM finally get called out. The solo that was Furholes is out of the lobby. 
and he's still got two Kraber shots. If you find a knock on the far end, you can take over X set spot. You can become the best positioned team in the lobby, but there's so much more to do as Furia start to move out. Like you said, one spot away from securing a bonus point, but they're shot from above. There's nowhere to go. They've got no safety, and it's just Watson left. This isn't a 1v1. There are 11 squads left, and Watson is down with just blue shields. The quickness with the pylons. Oh, and they get called out at the very end. No bonus point here for Furia. They get taken out of the lobby. It's a team playing right underneath them. Look how many squads that are gonna have to exit out of Norpad exactly to exit. GKS take this fight to exit the year. Exit managed to come out on top versus Meat Lovers and GKS looking to restabilize with Chaotic Much. And GKS in much the same position as Oxygen do need every point today to secure their spot as it is the last time that they will play in the regular season before regional finals if they put up put up enough points today they may not have to worry about how to secure a playoffs position they could make that so much easier with a good performance in this last game from up on top disguised are the ones with so many options but so little time to do it 10 seconds left before this game becomes all about exit seven squads left less than three seconds for the ring to close in I mean, Gladiator's closing the gap here. It's a calm before the storm after the scan to get the information. They have to make sure their backs are clear. They ping right behind them for the teams that are going to have to cross over the water. And they see them shooting at them. The G7 in Chaotic's hand dealing just enough pressure. But they're going to have to start wrapping up and actually closing in this gap. I mean, Gladiators are gone. And GKS take the next Caltrops, the next bit of cover that they've got. Not a whole lot to their name, but no team has real good positioning outside of Exit, who run this lobby right now. Red shields on Nocturnal, and they manage everyone. Be it Oblivion, be it Drop-In, be it GKS, nobody can step up to, oh my lord, Exit! Sorcerer throws in a couple good nades, Oblivion go down, but again, still beamed from afar. We're down to the top three squads, and Exit are just gonna walk in and take this. Exit have no competition in the last game. Exit are your Lisan al Gaim taking the final match of the day and securing themselves a good spot in the overall leaderboards. From the Kali to the Vision, they saw where that circle was going to pull at the very end, holding the best spot that they could hold. And that was with, what, 10 KP with a huge jump that they needed? They were sitting, I believe it was uh, 16th or so right before that game, and that has absolutely allowed them to skyrocket to top five at the very least. I, I can't believe that they got that much plot armor in the final match. And again, you, you said it. Not a, not a great position, around 16th in the overall leaderboard, or rather in the match leaderboards, 17th in the overall leaderboards. They need every point possible in order to push them into that top 11 situation where playoffs gets clinched, because otherwise you are going to be left relying on regional finals, and that's a fate you want to avoid. Especially if you're playing by the cusp too, and you don't want to get booted out of that top 11 spot on top of the 12 teams that would make it from the team that wins regional final. But man, what a final game this was. The exit dropping the big 10 KP on top of the dub. And Disguise, despite not getting a dub, still puts on double digit KP on the board. I, I would not mess with Disguise. I, I think they still had a lot of doubters coming into, and it sounds crazy to say, coming into this split, the way that they have performed be both before and after the change has been really second to none because they're doing it in such a different way. They are succeeding and they are doing so with comps, with strategies that no one else thought would really be possible. But being the only team to pull out Wraith on World's Edge, absolutely incredible. Lots of kills go to them, of course, here. 
But let's take a look at the bottom half of the leaderboard, the teams that perhaps did not do so well in this final match, because we are actually going to see a lot of names that we've become quite familiar with over the course of the day. TSM, notably, bottom half of the leaderboard right now. Nine Lies do end up down here again, even after their banger game in match five. And Sentinels, oh, Sentinels, I miss you so! But they simply have not found the mojo today. It's so crazy to see not only Sentinels on that bottom end, but we saw them really ramping up in the last time they played on their match day, but now falling in 20th, not finding that success that we were expecting them when they were hanging out on the cusp. Yeah, you mentioned it, 21-22 in the overall standings for the region, and TSM still having to figure out the changes for Season 20. This team falling down in 15th here, not being able to get the places that they needed for that final game, called out while hiding behind that rock. Quite difficult, of course. I do want to credit, while we're talking about teams that did struggle to succeed, GKS, who actually managed to really turn into turbo mode during this last game. They may not have been the most dominant team that we saw today, but they, alongside Oxygen, had a lot to lose in today's games and GKS in match six really did pull up and play great macro to eliminate other teams that were in vulnerable positions and micro in the sense that their 3v3s looked better than they have all split. That and nine lights comes to mind too when it comes to that. I want to bring back Rain Day to help us break down the ending of that six game after an insane six match day series that we've had so far, Rain Day. Some of these teams, even TSM, finalizing themselves probably in that 12th place spot after having some lackluster performances in the last few games. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's been a question mark for a lot of teams today. And I don't know, for some teams like Furia, maybe it answered some questions. And I think it put a period at the end of that, maybe even an exclamation point for teams like TSM. Uh, Phony was a little too on the nose with that. Uh, uncomfortable is how they kind of ended up feeling. Things didn't quite go their way. Maybe even raised some more questions about this meta and how things are working. But we also know that this was atypical when you saw the way these zones, uh, these final zones were turning in winners. We were seeing more points given throughout the course of the game just in KP, let alone the placement. So yes, it was a frenetic lobby. And as we go back through these final circles, you remember that on Stormpoint, we thought World's Edge was kind of crazy. Stormpoint even got crazier. And in game four, it was really about movement and taking those moments where you could make something happen and doing the most with them. Teams were sitting, who were passive, they were not getting the same level of results. I know we're going to hit those final circles in just a second, but even speaking about it, Vicky, just to finalize my answer to your question as we now are going to jump over there, I, I think that this is specifically in Apex signaling two things for us. It's signaling some teams are just finding rhythm. Some teams are, you know, in that place of desiring, uh, in the need of really needing to win because they know they may not qualify for land. The other element is that I think the uncomfortableness of what is the go-to choice for a meta like this when you're struggling. When so many characters are now on the board, so many things could be the problem. Rotation, communication, legend choices, uh, timing of fights. It's a lot to handle, and I think it is just going to take a little bit of extra time. And while we might be seeing some squads, even like here, TSM doing a great job to get into it, they can't quite get it completely done as Moist walk their way through it. So. There's a lot of levels to this. I'm sure the fans also watching at home, seeing a team like TSM not perform this way uh, very often. Uh, a little shocked, but this is all a part of the growing pains of learning a new season and 100 new different abilities. Honestly, it's also considering the fact that we're literally relearning a whole new meta with a change that has completely shifted the way that Apex has been played too in the final game with these perk systems being included. A hundred new perks and different playstyles being presented with so many other teams experimenting with that ring day. Yeah, and, and do, do you trust what's worked in the past or do you experiment and trailblaze? I think it's a lot easier for a team who hasn't been doing well or a team that has nothing to lose uh, to obviously go ahead and say, well, let's just try this. And it starts working to ride that wave of momentum. But Dia, in game five, uh, it would be Furia who would continue to ride that wave in this final circle. And, and they are, I will say, Rain Day, doing it off the back of exactly what you mentioned. A team like Nine Lies who was sitting there in this final zone going, we've got nothing to lose. Furia get to walk in, take their spot, turn it into a game win, and with some pretty stylish play, I will admit, there, were, there was style involved in this. It wasn't all macro as much as I love it. 
<laughs> you know, you gotta have some style points no matter who you are. Is Watson, you know, there's a few people who have come in and out. We've seen Alb leave and announce his retirement uh, just a few weeks ago. His Watson retired, but back, and you feel like watching this play today, he never left. In fact, Furia looking as good as they had when they were second place in the overall championships the first time they made a land and pioneered that seer meta that kind of got us very, very aggressive here. Game six, though, Vicky, you just cast it. Walk us through this one because obviously it was GKS. We're looking pretty good so far, but they didn't end up with a win. Yeah, because it was Exit that had the lead on that positioning from the very beginning, and all the kills came in their direction. No other team was going to cross into open ground and then put themselves in a pin situation with all the other squads that had to force their way out of the building from inside of this POI, now more so on towards the outside. Look at Exit's setup here. Between the Caustic Barrels, playing off the lip of the bins, they could get into a head glitch, even the Trident to cover their backs for the squads that had late rotated earlier before this final circle. They just had free range. GKS got some pretty nice nade damage going on, but it was at the very end, Exet that just was able to clean up everything else. This is what we're used to seeing from Exet. It had taken a long time, but I, I just got to say, Exet, even though they, they, they were slow, it doesn't mean that they didn't do enough because in that fight, they went all the way from 10th to 5th. It is just six points that separates the 10th place team to the fifth place team. So with that final kill of three points and that, uh, uh, excuse me, those three kills and that three placement points, they jumped up from 35 to 41. Dia, that is incredible. And of course, it's also Furia and Disguise who started the day in the lead and ended it. So huge for, for Xset, and I've been talking about them all day, so I'm going to do it again. I'm sorry, Rain Day, but GKS <laughs> picking up fourth place. This is massive for them. GKS aren't a team that has another opportunity to play, and so having high placements as, as we approach the end of their run, they're currently sat in ninth after today. They should jump up a little further, giving them some wiggle room to ultimately make it into the playoffs. And I will call out GKS again as being one of those teams that made it up from the Pro League qualifiers at the start of the split. Really massive movements coming in, especially from Furia having won the day, 25 points added. And here's where you start to get a little questionable. We were talking about and looking at TSM in the position of fifth, which is great, but they've got six matches played already. Dark Zero, Moist, Complexity, who are also in there. Furia, SSG Disguise have another match to play. So I don't know. I don't know. This is looking, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too excited if I was in that position. I'd be a little wary, but of course, that regional final, when you start to get the teams that will be in it, whoever's in that top 20 will have a chance not only to earn some continual points, but also to maybe, if they win at all, guarantee a spot at Lambic. Yeah, that's why I was looking at teams like Sentinel, you know, sweating a little bit if they're in that 21st spot here. And now looking on the other side, even these teams, Optic Gaming, I know all eyes are on Optic to perform for that final match day because they really need it. We know the potential on this team is great, but they haven't really been able to figure out where the consistency is. Exit just started picking things up, but is it too little too late is really the story here. But at least they're in 13th right now overall before we go on to our third page to see the squads that are struggling, that are on that cusp sentinels being one of those teams that i just mentioned right now phase being another one teams like evolution that they show up sometimes but then unfortunately they end up failing throughout the beginning part of this first split it's a rough spot to be in when you're in the bottom 10 as we're seeing so many right now i think fortunately especially when we come to the bottom eight those that will have to fight things out through the uh pro league qualifier in just a little while a lot of those are not in group a so you've still got a chance to make your way out the of course teams like sentinels are going to be the ones in the toughest positions there's a lot of pressure on sentinels next day and making it out of relegation in the same way as teams like legacy and exit have a lot of pressure on their next day to push themselves that further bit into the playoffs so you're saying there's a chance all right mm -hmm. we're gonna take it <laughs> 
we're throwing movie quotes around today so i had to add mine but i gotta say this has been a great day not just for someone who has shown up in the meta whenever he has and changed apex legends esports but also for someone who has left and come back now a resurgence not just in terms of content and popularity but in true performance what has made him such an electrifying star in our league and of course our mvp for today who i'm talking about is none other than his watson showed up in my opinion in one of the more interesting ways a pro and a content creator streaming ranked and grinding for the number one spot got into it with hal and the banter quickly grew into a team that when they went to land kept that same play style of being aggressive running at players and now what it's seen is a talented person has become an experienced person and he's added two other players next to him i'm madness who has been one of our most celebrated pros from just staying in the league for so long winning with clg back years ago or for some of our summer uh playoff moments and now putting it together with a, a person that he calls a brother keon and having the right pieces around him his watson clearly has the leadership and has the inspiration for his team and the trust, more importantly, by his teammates. And I think this is a squad now, not only do they have the ability to pop off, but they can play smarter and they're more consistent. That is why, in my opinion, Furia and his Watson is our MVP for today. And you just look at the damage dealt, 13 kills, 14 assists, 5K damage, an hour and 48 survival. I'm just kidding. I just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. it. It was supposed to be an hour and 47, an hour and 48. This is crazy. But all jokes aside, I really, really love uh, what we've been seeing him do. And I think the story has always been interesting with his Watson. And it leads us to better and better conversations about what does it really mean to succeed in the ALGS. Yeah, sometimes uh, things happen in a flash and they, they, take, they take hold, they catch fire. And that is something that has certainly happened uh, with his team. And so, uh, Vicky, you know, I think there's clearly a, uh, a lot of a magnetism to, to watching a player like his Watson uh, and what Furia and him represent and have represented ever since they've been to the ALGS. Especially being a positive player in the competitive Apex community, you know, Humble Beginnings was the first thing that I was met with when I had met his Watson at LAN and knowing his background and how he's been able to take a break from competitive Apex, then come right back in and frag out like he's never taken a break. It really highlights the skill that his Watson proceeds to carry over and guiding his team to victory too, because you mentioned Keon and having Keon alongside yeah. him, they bounce off of each other amazingly, Rain Day. Well, it's amazing that uh, you mentioned that, Vicky, because we now have a chance to bounce back and forth with some words with Keon, who's joining us on broadcast. Keon from Furia saying hello, man. Welcome uh, to the stream. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hey, dude. So, you know, all, all, all uh, pretenses aside, congratulations. You guys played great today. I We were kind of getting the sense that it was a little bit of... Um, a chaotic lobby in a way where a lot of kills were going on a lot of mid uh to that early late game fighting that was determining whether people were leaving with 8 12 kp and and then kind of you know where they place is where they place but they're already got basically 15 points in you guys dropped a 31 bomb today what did you feel playing in this lobby was it different was it something you felt really comfortable in uh, just talk us through how it felt playing in today's matches yeah, I mean, coming off of like last week, it's been, it was like a little rough. Um, at the update, we kind of had an identity crisis during the scrims. After the update, we were like really farming scrims. There's multiple 19, 15, 17 kill games, uh, dubs in scrims that uh, like we were kind of used to, right? Um, but when the ALGS came around last week, we, uh, we just had like an identity crisis. We didn't really stick to the game plan. And so like, um, like the lobbies, I felt like the lobby last week just felt really weird for us because we didn't like do what we practiced for and then like this whole week um we like really hammered down on making sure that we stick to our game plan uh we even like kind of swapped up the roles took a lot of the load off of madness madness was our hard igl uh the first half and uh he didn't really transition super well into this new meta um but the lobby the lobby uh like tonight um it's just like kind of the meta like it, teams will get eight kills die in the 10th place and call it a good day you know with 10 10 points um and then the people that win it's like it's usually just like a big game like most of the time you're not seeing as many of the like last year you'd see a lot more of like the crypto watson teams winning with like four kills uh that's not the case 
as much anymore. A lot of teams are just nuking out uh, because they've adjusted to the meta like faster than everybody else. Well, today was Dia Furio for real. I mean, you finished off the day with 14 KP too by yourself. His Watson coming in right after you with 13 kills. So you guys had a pretty heavy kill game and you guys stuck to your gameplay of where you guys exceed the most, which is finding those kills. I like how you talked about ironing out the things that you had to figure out too and finding your identity in a meta right now where other teams I feel like are still struggling. I mean, we're seeing the top end teams not having that consistency. And I'm happy that you highlighted that because you guys are also the only team Team in the lobby running a Watson against an entire lobby 19 teams playing caustic I mean talk to us a little bit about the difference in different regions and how certain legends are more prevalent than others like the fact that we don't see crypto or Watson versus a very heavily caustic meta right now well in other regions I feel like more people are willing to take risks and find like the thing that uh works for them um that's one thing that me and Watson do really well is like we don't really care what the other 19 teams play. Like we're going to play what we think will work. And like, that was a huge thing that we like, we're talking about this whole last week was like Manus. Manus was pretty stuck on like, we got to play Bang, Caustic and uh, Bloodhound. And Watson was like, like when, a, when everybody plays Caustic, Caustic is like less valuable. Right. So, because he can't really, he can't, he only hurts two thirds of every team. Um, mm -hmm. So pretty much like I feel some teams like complexity, they're playing a, a Watson um, in on storm point a lot. And like they're, they're doing really well also. And it's just like, I think NA just doesn't have like the, uh, the, the courage to take like more risks as other regions do at the moment. And that's like really the only reason like that you only see a, a, like one Watson um, and like 19 caustics. You know, you've mentioned taking risks, but also the fact that <clears throat> there's a different read within the team, how you've taken a, you've helped, excuse me, how you've helped Madness and the team sort of overcome what was an overloading uh, on Madness. And the team dynamic is something that a lot of people will admire about Furia. How do you manage having difficult conversations or when you, when you and Watson or you and Madness feel that something isn't going exactly right how do you navigate having conversations about what you need to change while still maintaining the friendship that's so clear in your uh in your squad yeah um i mean the way we maintain it is like we have an amazing coach as well uh pvpx he changed recently rebranded to jmo um he, he does a great job at like kind of like calling us out if we're being like grumpy poo poo heads uh you know just <laughs> not in a good mood he'll be like hey dudes like it's not that serious. Like we're here to get better. Like stop being so negative. And uh, like, if you, if, if any of like the viewers and stuff are watching any of the streams this week, like it was a rough week. Like the last two weeks for fury has been really bad. Um, our vibes were not, were not great, but uh, for the last like four, four days or so in between either sets on our double block day or, or after scrims or before scrims, uh, like pvp sets us up with a perfect game plan and sometimes it's sometimes me and watson butt heads but like that's just what brothers do right it's brotherly love sometimes recently like the last the last week madness and watson were butting heads a lot and i was the mitigator like i i had to give them three or four different pep talks um make sure that everybody knows that they're trusted and valued uh we 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 struggled a lot the last weekend with trust and uh, not trusting everybody's calls um because it's a it's a team game at the end of the day so uh like really, I think I think it clicked yesterday for us last night in scrims. Uh, we like had a whole open like just a team bonding like heart to heart, and uh, uh, obviously it, it helped a lot because we went from taking bottom five in scrims to winning an LGS day. Listen, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say this is a bad thing, but if you want to be in charge of uh, media training for all of the pros when we get to land, because I think you <laughs> answered those questions more in depth than we could have ever hoped for. You answered them better than me. You might you might need to be up here, <laughs> Keon, man. But c congrats on all the play. Jokes aside, congrats on all the play uh, today. You guys killed it, and uh, it was a t it was a close one between you and Disguise, but you put out the W. And uh, good luck for the rest of the season. Obviously, regional finals, and hopefully land. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I'll see you guys later, I guess. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. All right, Keon with us there. Great talking to him and uh, 
you know, Dia, I think he said something that's is a tale as old as time. It's a tried and true statement about the world. You got to stop being grumpy poo poo heads sometimes. You basically just can't let that happen. True, true, true. true. I, I could, I could, I literally couldn't have put it better, better myself. <laughs> uh, you know, Vicky, listen, closing out the day. What a great, great day. I, I think is, uh, you know, we see the game continuing to evolve in season 20. And it seems like with players and teams, they're going through the same struggles everyone is of trying to learn and get to the form that they feel confident in, especially as we head towards more and more pressure, more and more money, more and more stakes here in the ALGS. And I love how he highlighted the disparity between the different regions too, because that's what we were theory crafting, right? When it comes to who feels more comfortable and what composition are we going to be seeing teams swap back over to their prime comps that worked out for them. But here in NA, at the end of the day, top 20 teams qualify to play in the regional finals and the top 11 teams and the winner of the regional finals will eventually advance to the split one playoff. So time is ticking down for a lot of these teams to figure out where they want to stand in the overall standings here in the region. Well, Dia as well, you got to see the action. Teams you had focused on, like Xset, they made a move. And and at this point, that's kind of all you can hope for. It was good, um, but and, and they stuck with it till the very end. Yeah, I, and I, a lot of this meta is, I think, about, tr about trusting yourself. Keon brought it up as well. So I am glad that a team's experienced as Xset with as many hopes on them as Xset. A lot of fans out there managed to do just that. And I walk away very happy with a lot of teams today. I think we got some really amazing Apex Legends. Well, one thing we definitely got was some really amazing casting. You two, great job today. Always a pleasure working with you and cannot wait till we do it again. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Vicky Kitty and Dia there. And you know, that means when I say goodbye to them, it means it's time to start saying goodbye to you. But let me give you a reminder if your phone or a calendar or a notification isn't going to do it for you apex is serving the daylight savings reminder right now that's a big one i'm actually literally being reminded of that as i tell you so we're all in the same place spring forward means i think we we uh we, we lose an hour unfortunately so we jump ahead and that means that whatever you got to do to be here at 10 a.m do it, especially if you're on the West Coast, 5 p.m. GMT, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, match day nine. Ladies and gentlemen, setting up our regional finals. And who will kick it off? Well, it's the new Orgless in Hungary, no longer Orgless. They're not a spin seer. And this is obviously a great time to get represented. Big things like land around the corner in the regional final. Tyler, Matafe, and Kinda want to keep up that rhythm. but. The man we talked to earlier today as well, Hockeys, will now be in competition. Trying to change uh, the dynamic that happened with Yuki and keep it going because him, Effect, and Unlucky have been on a nice rhythm. I think sitting in fifth right now and they climb even higher. And a team that just is so fun to watch, that Sentinel in the hands of Monsoon, now in the hands of many more people, kind of impacting the meta complexity. What else will they do? All of that coming in tomorrow. And that means North America means teams who are sitting back and watching today like phony and ssg they're gonna have their chance to move up into the rankings as well already in the top 10 and they've got an extra day to play this team zainu he called him the best in north america can he prove it can space station take a win there big shout out to all of our orgs ssg and navi recently back in apex we love seeing that and we love keeping up to date with all of the things going on around our esport if you want to keep up to date make sure to follow us on play apex esports on x and twitch.tv slash play apex we also have play apex esports on youtube where a lot of great clips a lot of great videos highlights of final circles and some shorts whoever's doing that good job shorts if you want to bite-size apex action during your day remember Apex is still here even though we're leaving, so go jump into game or download it if you're watching and play for free the game that over 100 million players have already known and loved and that is the core of our eSport. My name has been Rain Day. As always, never give up, never stop gaming, and we will see you all next time.